So I have a question. Can everyone just raise their hand? No, everybody, like you too. Yeah, there he's like, I'm not raising my hand. Um, okay, so we all, almost everyone can raise their hand. How many people have an empty seat next to them? Very few. Can you please raise your hand? So someone who's standing, go visit that guy who's got his bag on the seat. So you can take his bag and give it back to him. There's an empty seat over there. Uh, there's a couple down here. I know you can't see the screen, but I talk more. The slides are not as important. So if you want to sit here, there's one or two slots. There's one slot there. Um, in my country, well, that's difficult to say what my country is, but the country I was born in, uh, this would be a fire hazard. We all would die if there was a fire. Um, though we all might die with a lack of AC. So you said you're going to get the AC on, right? So this is the guy that we beat up. <laughs> now, I've been watching IPL, and I remember about 10 years ago, a cricket player made a big mistake in India versus Pakistan. I forget his name. He made a big mistake. And I think it was in Bombay. And they went to his house and burnt his house down. And then they took their jerseys off, and they made a bonfire in the middle of town, and they burned all the jerseys and all the, the merchandise with the guy's face on it. Just because he, you know, you know, might have given, he was a poor bowler, you know, gave up a few sixes when India was supposed to win to arch rival Pakistan, right? I've, so I've seen Indians riot. Um, last year in the prisons, they rioted because they turned off the IPL. Remember that? That was interesting. So I think we can all riot if they turn off the air conditioning, right? Do we have it in us? Do we have it in us? And he's our first target? Okay, so can you please make the AC work? They're already switched on. I don't believe them. Okay, I have a couple T-shirts. Has everyone visited my company's booth? Uh, did you, so I know the T-shirts are a precious commodity, so I'm going to have some trivia questions and give out T-shirts uh, through the day. So we're going to talk about agile development. And, um, well, there's a little bit about the session. So how many folks here, well, first of all, let's practice again. Everyone just raise your hand. It's just good exercise. Okay, if I catch anyone falling asleep, we're going to do the jab right. Does everyone know what the jab right is? It's you're just going to punch the person to your right. <laughs> so if I see one person sleeping, right, we're all going to punch the person to our right. Now, those of you on the side, just like in a video game, you got to get up, go around, and punch those people. <laughs> so no one's allowed to fall asleep. So this session was put together to kind of introduce the, the, the class to agile development. Who is brand spanking new to agile development? OK. Oh, more than I thought. Well, I'd say 25%. Mm, How many people are the other side? Absolute experts in agile. No one's willing to admit it. <laughs> OK, who's a, a sort of an expert in agile? Sort of an expert. You, when I'm tired, when I sleep, and I say jab right, you could come up and fill in for me. I got that. OK. Um, how many people are implementing Agile at their organization now, or work in an organization that has Agile implemented? OK, maybe less than half. How many people are not using Agile? Should be everyone else. Just checking. OK. So of those people who just voted, this India is the world's largest democracy. I'm glad you're exercising your right to vote. Um, I was here last year doing voting, and a very smart law you have in this country, like you're not allowed to drink during the whole month of voting. Like, I really think that if we did that, we'd have no things like Bill Clinton or George Bush, but that's a different story. <laughs> so of the people who just rose their hand and said they have um, no Agile in their organization, um, are you implementing or thinking of implementing Agile in the future? OK. So and how many people here just because it sucks the least of all the other sessions? <laughs> just checking. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to assume um, that you're not necessarily an expert in Agile, except for this one gentleman. He'll, but it's good, you're not in a good seat. You can't really see the, the, the board that well. So we're going to assume that everyone here is not an expert in Agile. And I'm going to give an overview of the um, Agile methodology, and, and specifically Scrum. And then, oh, see, they, they didn't turn on the air conditioning, because I know the exact switch, which is the air conditioning switch. And there are the three guys. That, how many men does it take to turn on an air conditioning? Apparently three. So, I've noticed in India, this is about my 20th time to India. I've been to India many times. And I've noticed that it takes a lot of people to do simple things. Like, actually, there's four guys in there now arguing about the air conditioning. Like, I'll pay the electric bill. It's that hot. OK, so we're going to assume that you want to implement Agile. And I assume you know something about Agile. 
but I will kind of go over all the basics. In case, you know, there's people who don't. I'll also use the concept I call agile presenting, meaning is I have a slide deck here, but I have an agenda, but I'd like to do more what you want to talk about. Okay, so you know, I'll probably lecture for the first hour or so and take some questions along the way. But if we find out we want to spend more time on estimating or more time on you know, the daily scrum or whatever it is, we'll spend more time on something like that. So it's really up to you. I know we're a large group, and I know um, it might not be easy to do that, but we will. So as I said, the, the, the last bullet, for those of you who can't see, or can't see the, the slides, it's not a huge deal, but the last bullet says the success of the seminar depends on you. Okay? It's an easy way for the speaker to cop out, right? Like, oh, <laughs> doesn't work. I don't know if you know, do you fill out evaluation forms? In the forms. That's because we have the forms, because we fill out evaluations on the audience. <laughs> and, if you, and if you're a bad audience, you're not allowed to come back next year. <laughs> so I, I, I encourage you to ask some questions. Uh, there's my bio, but it um, doesn't matter, because you, uh, I was already graciously introduced as a prestigious speaker or something like that. OK, so here's kind of our rough agenda. We're going to talk, we're going to do a little bit of an introduction to Agile and specifically Scrum. Then we'll, that will probably take us most of the morning, and then we'll probably, maybe the whole morning, depending on how many questions we get. And then in the afternoon, we'll look at Agile estimation. And that might take us the whole afternoon, depending on what we like. If we have more time or more interest, we'll talk about uh, tools and teams. And to be honest with you, is it's more fun to talk about the estimation and the, and the scrum itself. We usually get lots of questions, so we probably won't get to the tools. But if we do, we'll spend you know, as long as 30 minutes or as short as 10 minutes on tools. We'll cover something about tools before the end. That's our rough agenda. So first question is, what is Agile? Does anyone can tell me what it is? You can read it off the slide. <laughs> so what's interesting is about well, 10 years ago or so, a bunch of people got together and they said, you know, building software is a thing. The users are always complaining. The developer is always complaining. All these projects seem to, you know, make my hair fall out and make my hair go gray and all that other fun stuff. So they got together and they wrote this thing called the Agile Manifesto. Has anyone ever heard of the Agile Manifesto? Okay, a few. You can go to agilemanifesto.org and look at it. What the Agile Manifesto says is a bunch of values. Okay, so it doesn't prescribe anything like you must do a scrum every day for 15 minutes or you must do this, you must do that. It's just a set of broad values. Values like we are going to stress communication with the business over process and documentation. We're going to value bringing business value to the users sooner you know, than arguing about implementation. We're going to value you know, the software itself over the fundamental architecture and technology. That's not saying that, oh, we're not going to architect an application. But a lot of times when developers sit down to write an application, we think of the cool new stuff we can use, right? Come on, admit it. No one? Ah, I like honesty. You're the only honest person in this room. Who thinks it's pretty darn hot in here? No one? I do. I'm ready to riot. So. Out of the Agile Manifesto, a bunch of practices kind of evolved. And, you know, there's a lot of kind of religion and orthodox around some of these practices. But in reality, Agile is about particular values. It's about providing business value sooner and stressing communication. Okay, so you see my first bullet, if you can see the slides. I said, you know, Agile basically is a methodology that stresses communication and deliverables. And I would argue you also would want to say um, stresses flexibility, both on the business and the technology side. Okay, so in a nutshell, that's agile. And in a nutshell, that's all you need. Okay? We're going to talk, of course, a lot deeper. So some of the practices that are involved are XP, or extreme programming. And I, I remember about 10 years ago when the extreme programming book came out. And one of my friends, I was the chief technology officer of a uh, dot com, and I had about 30 developers, and someone gave me the XP book, and it fundamentally changed my life. There, there were things in the book that I did not agree with, but there were things in that book that made really sense. You know, first was iterative development, okay, right, doing small cycles and producing a production quality something, chunk of an application 
every two to four weeks. And I've been doing that for 10 years now, ever since I read that book. The other thing it stressed was pair programming, which in the beginning I believed in, and now I don't believe in as much, and, and my opinion changes all the time. Another, another aspect of XP is the notion that the business user and the technology developer sit next to each other, right? And while I don't necessarily advocate that, and I'm, I'm sure most of you or some of you are working in an offshore environment where your customers might be in different time zones, that's obviously impossible. But remember, it's about values. And the value, what, what's the value from that, which is we're going to give you the opportunity to talk to the business more often, stressing communication. So that's pretty much XP, which was the very first agile kind of methodology. And out of XP grew Scrum you know, in the last seven years or so. And Scrum has gotten very popular. It's actually the most popular of all the agile, um, agile methodologies. And Scrum basically takes a lot of those values from XP, iterative development, communication. Um, it doesn't say that the developers have to sit with the technology people, but it takes that core agile value of you know, stressing communication, fostering communication, high bandwidth teams, rapid feedback. Lately, over the last number of years, not probably in the last uh, two years, uh, domain-driven design has kind of cropped up as an agile methodology. That's just an, another prescription. You could actually use domain-driven design as a development methodology with an agile kind of process. And same with TDD, or test-driven development. And then all of this is supported by things like continuous integration, where people don't realize that continuous integration is actually a pretty agile you know, a pretty agile methodology. Anyone here using some form of continuous integration in their organization? Okay, almost, almost half. The guy who did not turn on the air conditioning rose his hand in the wind, behind the window. He thinks I can't see him. I can see you and I'm coming for you at lunch. Okay, so if you don't know what continuous integration is, it's the process of frequent check-ins and when you check in your code, a bunch of stuff happens. That stuff will usually be what I call enforcement, right? You will check the style of the code. You'll check, you know, meaning what's the style of the code? You know, you might have a rule in your organization the way variables are named. You might have a rule in your organization, always use camel case, have a comment after every X lines of code. Those types of things are enforced. And if the code that's being checked in does not adhere to that, it's denied a check-in. The next thing that usually happens after enforcement in a continuous in integration stream is a build is done, and the build is done, and then a bunch of unit tests are run against those builds. So continuous integration works tightly with um, you know, test-driven development. If those unit tests fail, you're not allowed, it's rolled back. You're not allowed to check in. And then the continuous, continuous integration keeps going. If it passes that test, then it does an integration with the entire application, right, or the entire suite that you're building. And then those unit tests are run and then it kind of goes out and says, oh, okay, you can do that. The nice thing about that, that can happen a dozen times a day. Okay? It can happen many, many times a day. When I first started coding in the black and white ancient times before IntelliSense and before integrated development environments when things like Notepad and Emacs were your best friend, we had no such thing as continuous integration, and we had no way to actually perform these types of checks. So what we did is had a nightly build. And to us, that was agile. Like, that, was, that was momentous because a lot of people would only do a build maybe every three or four days. Right? So we've went from doing nightly builds now to doing you know, maybe as many as 10 or 12 builds a day. What's the purpose of performing these checks besides the enforcement? Can anyone take a guess? Exactly. The immediate feedback to know if you broke someone else's code or if your code is incompatible with something else. Right? So back to the agile values, the reason why the reason why continuous integration is such a strong tenant of the agile methodology is because it stresses that communication, right? It stresses that instant feedback. Okay, good. So here's just some bullets on the agile manifesto. I'm, I know many of you can't read it. This is just kind of here for reference. But what's most important is that there are a core set, and what I need you to walk away with is not, especially the people who can't see it, you don't need to memorize this slide. You go to agilemanifesto.org and read not only all of this, but read the entire manifesto. You can even sign it. You can add yourself as a signatory. I signed it 10 years ago. You can easily add yourself as a signer to the Agile Manifesto. 
sounds bad like the Communist Manifesto, I always joke. I said they should have named it something different. But I've made peace with the, with the word Agile Manifesto. And once again, the reason why I put it down there is most of the Agile Manifesto is values, not prescription, not do this. Okay? So just to read one for the folks that can't see it is working software is delivered frequently. That's just a value. You can define frequently, it's, right? You, you, you and your organization can actually define that, right? So it's not like there's these rules that say you have to do it this way or you have to do it that way. Okay. So uh, my favorite one is even late changes in requirements are welcomed. Who likes getting changes? Oh, boy, can I take all your CVs and come work for me? Okay, so only like 10 people out of the whole room. Yeah, usually software developers hate changes. But in reality, if you want the piece of software you're working on to be a success, and what do you get from the successful software project? You get happiness because you have done something successful, and theoretically a product that will go out and make your company some money. Um, usually you will need these last-minute changes. And um, as I said, that's more of a, um, oh, 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 you can't see this because it gives away my first trivia question. OK. So faster, faster. OK. So my first trivia question for a Telerik t-shirt is the following. We're now going to talk about Scrum. So Scrum is you know, a development, or not a development, but is an agile methodology. Where did Scrum come from? And don't say rugby, and I know I'm wearing a rugby shirt. We'll talk about that in a minute. Where was the first place? Now, you're going to say, ooh, the Agile Manifesto. Wrong. So I'm already answering the first question for you and giving you an opportunity. So let's start easy. You could either give me the name of the publication, the author, or the country of origin. or What? Ken Schwober is a fraud. Ken Schwober claims he invented the Agile Manifesto. And I was a believer. I used to worship at the altar of Ken Schwober. And then I went to business school. That's a hint. Anyone want to take a guess? Harvard Business School, you win. Can you believe that? Harvard Business School. A Japanese dude in 1986 wrote an argue, not an argue, an article that said, we're losing the relay race. It was assigned to me as reading in a strategy class in business school. I'm reading it, and they're talking about Scrum. I'm like, holy. <laughs> I said, my whole career is a fraud. I go, I signed the Agile Manifesto in 2000, 14 years after Scrum was identified by Japanese of all people. So yes, does anyone know anything about rugby? That's question number two. Who won the Rugby World Cup? South Africa. South Africa. Who said that? Does anyone know what team's jersey I'm wearing? UK. Wrong. UK. Scotland is close. Not close geographically, but I'm Scottish. I'm half Scottish. Ireland? No, I didn't say close geographically. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. The name of the country is on the jersey. Hong Kong. Thank you, Hong Kong. There we go. <laughs> there is an event in Hong Kong called the Hong Kong Rugby Sevens. And um, it's the, the, the smaller version of the, wor of the uh, World Cup. But let me look. Uh, let's see. Is it here? Is it here? Let's see. I have a picture. Does everyone know what a relay race looks like? Anyone watch the Olympics in the summertime? Yes? No? It's really hot like it is here usually in the Summer Olympics. So a relay race works like this. I run and I have the baton. Right? Oops, that's not a good baton. <laughs> My country would lose the relay. So do Indians have relay race sprinters in the Olympics? Yes, OK. So the first guy then, then the next guy starts running, and they hand the baton off. Right? And then the next guy runs, and they do this four times. What does that sound like to you? Right? Old waterfall. Right? Waterfall was a relay race. We just kind of handed the baton off and forgot about it. Right? So the requirements guys would, you know, first the business would dream up of an application, hand the baton off to some kind of people to write up a specification. Every once in a while they might get an email, and if we're graced with their presence, they might actually respond. What did you mean by blah, blah, blah? 
Then the business people just toss it over to the developers. Developers go into their own little world, caffeine, you know, caffeinated, pizza-driven world. They get their baton. Then the developers just throw it over the wall to the QA people, right? Don't we do that? Yeah, yeah of course, right? Throw it over the wall to the QA people. Then the QA people throw it over the wall. Well, they usually throw it back to the wall. <laughs> That's like the, the backwards relay race. Like, I don't know, who thinks speed walking should not be an Olympic event? Like, it's the stupidest event of all time, like these people speed walking. They should have the backwards one for software developers and QA people. We'd win the gold medal, right? Infinite loop. So that baton goes back and forth a few million times. Once QA finally gets it, they throw it over the wall to the production people, say, you implement it, you, right? You know, and somewhere the marketing people might get a baton even thrown to them as well, okay? So in rugby, anyone here a fan of rugby? One guy. Now I'm just going to give you a t-shirt because you're a fan of my favorite sport. <laughs> See how easy it is to win a t-shirt? No stealing his t-shirt. I'm watching you, Mr. I didn't raise my hand before. So what happens is when the ball, get, we have no internet connection. I went to the, to the rugby sevens. I took tons of pictures of people in a scrum. And um, unfortunately, um, all these high fidelity, awesome amateur photography that I did is unavailable because it's on my Facebook account and I can't get on the internet. So I had one on my phone of an actual advertisement in Hong Kong, if you can see. I look like them. They're a little stronger and fitter, but yes. Um, so in rugby, the whole team gets together and goes down the field as a unit with the ball, okay, in the scrum. It's kind of like when they do the initial face-off. And that is the analogy that this dude from Japan came up with, um, you know, practically 30 years ago when he came out with the article in Harvard Business School, that we're losing the relay race. So how does this translate into specifics? Because the Harvard Business School article is fairly generic. It doesn't say, you know, QA person must do this at this time. That's where Ken Schwaber comes in, right? He has obviously read this and not told anyone, because I'm probably the only other idiot in the technology industry to go read a Harvard Business School case, OK? So Schwaber obviously read this and then adapted the concepts to a specific prescription. Okay? And he came up with the ideas of the you know, two-week sprints, four-week sprints, all that other fun stuff. So what exactly is Scrum? Well, we know what it is in rugby now. right? So Scrum is, is an agile methodology which stresses communication. If you don't remember anything today besides that Schwaber's a fraud, um, if you remember nothing else, I want you to remember that. So I'll say it again. Scrum is an agile methodology which stresses communication. Now, let me ask you this question. How many people work in a company that has some problems? <laughs> wow, everybody. How many people think that Scrum will solve your problems? You came here today saying, oh, I have all these problems, and Steve is going to make them all go away by teaching me Scrum. Who thought that? Be honest. Holy, come on, no one really gave me that credit. <laughs> a lot of people just put their hands. All right, I'm going to give away a t-shirt to everyone who votes. Come on, it's the world's largest democracy, and you're not voting. OK, so you have this environment, and you're going to implement Scrum. If you have a bad environment, like you have some problems, Scrum is going to make it worse. I want to say that I paused for effect. One, I need to be completely honest with you. That's one of my tenets about honesty and transparency. But Scrum will actually make it worse. And here's why. Because Scrum stresses communication, it will expose the dysfunction of your organization sooner. Follow me? So what will happen if you have a lot of problems in your organization? They'll be exposed as opposed to waterfall where you can hide it for a while. Okay? So Scrum will actually make the process work. So here's an example. Let's say you have a business owner who's just a complete idiot. I don't mean business owner, the person who owns the business. I just introduced a Scrum term for those of you that don't understand. A business owner is the 
the business person who owns your project. Okay? We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but in a nutshell, that's what it means. But, you know, we're a company that builds cement. <laughs> gives it off to the business analyst, and then the business analyst gives it off to the functional requirements. How, a month has passed already, right? Functional requirements gives it off to the developers. You guys code it for three months and come out with a beta. So we're, three, four, we're four months in. And the business analyst goes, oh, that's not what I want. I want the construction stuff for, you know, what do you mean space shuttle? I, you know, he was taking, you know, drugs that day or something, right? So it took us four months to get that feedback using Waterfall. With Scrum, you're going to get that feedback almost instantaneous. You're going to get that after two weeks or so. We'll talk about that when we start getting deeper into the specifics of Scrum. Why is that good, did you say? Oh, no, you, oh, you, you're agreeing with me. Yes, that is good. Meaning is so Scrum, that's why Scrum is so popular. Scrum exposes these dysfunctions sooner and Scrum doesn't fix them. It gives you the opportunity as an organization to fix it. Okay? Waterfall hides it. So did you say Waterfall was bad or Scrum was bad? Right. It, it, exactly. You get a t-shirt for agreeing with me. <laughs> and I'm out of t-shirts. I, I, I'll have more after lunch to give away to lucky audience members who answer questions and agree with me. Just randomly say, Steve, you look really awesome in that rugby jersey. Like, you'll get two t-shirts. <laughs> So, Scrum will, by stressing communication and stressing rapid delivery cycles, you will expose the problem sooner, but also then gives you the opportunity to work them out. Working them out is up to you. Scrum doesn't tell you how to do that. So I want to be honest. Scrum is no, we say in the United States, silver bullet. Okay? Scrum is no silver bullet. Scrum is no magic cure to your organization's problems. Actually, when you, in, when you initially use Scrum, it's going to expose those problems faster, which is good, as this lady just mentioned. Okay? Because by exposing it faster, it gives you the opportunity to fix it. Now, a really important thing about Scrum is that it lets the business set the priorities. And by having the business set the priorities, you can turn around and reprioritize the development effort based upon the priorities that they set. And they will have the opportunity to change those priorities after every deliverable. I have a question all the way in the back. Uh, as you mentioned that uh, uh, Scrum might expose some of the problems or many of the problems. So uh, that is precisely the dampener for most of the organization not to get into Scrum. And probably we, will, uh, we do not never take the first step. So my question is that I understand that there are problems. So you said, I will paraphrase your question, so if some people didn't hear, is, so Scrum exposes the problems faster. Some organizations may not like that. So then, wow, that was weird. I just said, then air conditioning came on. <laughs> oh, well, that was worth a try. So then, how do we take the first step? How do we actually, you know, get the organization to go up and say, ooh, we are actually going to use Scrum, even though we know it's going to expose you know, things sooner. Well, you have a few options. The first option is lie. Is don't tell them it's going to expose the problem sooner. <laughs> you just came back from Scrum training. You know it's going to expose the problem sooner. You know that the problem is them, not you. Um, it's not necessarily the most honest way, but if you're desperate, I'm not, I'm not joking. Um, you know, a little bit of white lying might go you know, a long way. I don't recommend that in all cases. Another case is to find an extremely important project in your organization, like maybe the lifeblood of your organization, that's failing or just not going well, and say, we've never done Scrum before, let's use Scrum. And a lot of people look at me and say, oh, wow, Steve, that, I, the word, I, said, I did this lecture in Amsterdam about five years ago, and someone said, that is career suicide. And I said, no, it's not. Keeping the project that's failing on a failing course is career suicide. Right? Trying something new, it can't be any worse. Right? At worst, it'll be just as crappy as Waterfall. At best, you'll actually succeed and send the project. So that's the second one. That's a tough sell internally because businesses are risk adverse. They're like, whoa, we're going to try this new methodology on this. Don't you know this is the most important project in the organization? However, that's what I recommend. I've done that in the past. 
That's what Schwaber, you hear us talk about Ken Schwaber, he's like the scrum god, we all worship him. Um, yeah, 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 whatever. Um, that's what he will prescribe. If you, if you called him up and said, come consult in my company, I would bet you a million rupees, that's exactly what he would say. He would say, get your most important project, your highest exposure project, and let's use Scrum on that. The third option is a pilot project on something small. Okay? And that's if the first two fail. If you're not up to lying, and if you're not up to making your most important project a Scrum project, then do a small pilot project to build some trust, and then move on from there. The problem is it's almost like a zero, one binary system. It's very difficult to have an organization partly on Scrum and you know, partly on Waterfall or something else. It's kind of like if part of, I live in Hong Kong, and we drive on the Indian side of the road, which I call the wrong side of the road because I'm originally from America. Okay? So Hong Kong, like India, drives on the incorrect side of the road. The rest of my country of China drives on the correct side of the road. It's damn British. So, when we drive from Hong Kong to Shenzhen, which is about a 20-minute drive, cross the border, whoa, hell breaks loose. Right? So, they've done some things to accommodate, like the toll booth has one on the far right-hand side that has it where they can give you the toll on this side as opposed to having to get into the passenger seat and pay the toll. Right? So, they've made some changes, but in reality, is they just made a blanket rule. You know, people from Hong Kong can't drive their private cars in China, right? You have to rent a car at the border. You have to get special permission to drive your car in China. You're allowed to, but with special permission. So similar type of thing. It's very difficult for a country to drive on the left and the right side simultaneously without some special kind of prescriptions going on. Same thing with Scrum. It's really a buy-in at the enterprise level. So if you do a pilot project, it's with the auspices or it's with the goal of trying to then, after this pilot project, do it across the entire organization. Okay? So in essence, it really is a swallowing the pill organizationally wide. So the first step is one of those three options. Ho hopefully, you'll be able to take one of them in that respect. Any other questions before I uh, start getting to some of the specifics of Scrum? Yes, sir. And this is interesting because when I was driving on over to the uh, session, I was arguing with one of my colleagues about large teams versus small teams. And the answer is yes. So Scrum will dictate, so to speak, that the maximum number of people allowed on a team is nine. I personally believe that number should be seven or lower. So you're saying to me, oh, but we're 80 people. Well, what you do is you then break it into, if you're 80 people, maybe 10 teams. And we'll talk about that actually before lunch, we're going to go through all the scrum material before lunch. After lunch, we'll do estimation and offshoring and tools. And there's something called the scrum of scrum and things like that. But I'm actually going to kind of defer the second half of my answer um, for about 40 minutes or so until we get to that portion. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So when you're saying you're building the architecture for an application, or all your team does is architecture? So let me ask you another question. Let me ask you this question. Is does the, the enterprise-wide architecture, are you architecting for the whole company? Or are you architecting, and then people take your architecture and build apps on top of that architecture? Or are you architecting the specific applications? So you're... you're Gotcha. Perfect. So he has a framework level architecture. A good example of this, anyone here from the Microsoft universe? Or at least familiar with the Microsoft universe? Not that many. Um, there's, Microsoft has a framework called .NET, okay? And then they have things that build on top of .NET, right? They have all these applications that build on top of it. So you're kind of the people building the .NET, the frameworks. And I would argue that um, Scrum has values, right? Back to the agile methodology and the actual prescription and methods of Scrum may not be applicable because you're building something that's very technology-driven, not business-driven. And Scrum just may not be the exact answer for you. You can use a different methodology, which I call Scrum But. Ever hear of that one? Anyone hear of Scrum But? Anyone using Scrum But? Who's using Scrum right now? I guarantee you're all using Scrum But and don't know it. It goes like this. Are you using Scrum? Yes, but... <laughs> I've changed this, 
and I've changed it. So you can use scrum buds. Meaning is, everything I'm going to tell you over the next 40 minutes or so about the specifics of scrum is in a vacuum in the, in the lab, okay? In the perfect world. I want to be clear on that, right? So everything I'm going to teach you right now is in the perfect world. There's no way you're going to implement this, back to that gentleman's question, you know, right off the bat, right, right from the start, is it's very difficult to implement all of it at once. That's number one. Number two is in your organization, you're going to have a different scenario. You're going to have a different environment. And maybe not everything in the Agile methodology and Scrum will work as prescribed by the experts, but just read that Agile manifesto and try to adhere to the values. And the values are things like stressing deliverables, stressing communication, being flexible. Okay? So I would, I would recommend you almost to go and do that than actually say, okay, we're going to do Scrum religiously in an environment where Scrum may not be 100% applicable. Question? Absolutely. So if you didn't hear what the gentleman said is, you know, in essence, you have deliverables, you have to communicate with people, so you can still use those portions of Scrum, right? Which is totally true, and that's exactly what I'm saying, right? Is you want to use portions of Scrum that will make sense to your environment. So right now, lightning should be coming out of the sky and hitting me in the head, and Ken Schwaber might magically appear in front of me and take away my certified Scrum certifications, because I'm telling you to deviate from um, the norm. Just, how many people here like Schwaber? Who know, even know who I'm talking about? No one knows this, this dude. We'll Google him later if we get the, um, if we get the um, internet connection fixed. But he actually does, does not like people changing Scrum. So let's start getting into some of the specifics because some of the questions I was getting were starting to talk a little bit about the specifics. So let me um, speak to a couple slides and then we can also pause in maybe 10 more minutes or so and take some more questions. But, so some of the specifics are about Scrum are pretty cool. This is all, you know, the optimal case. You're probably not going to be able to obtain all of this on the first go. The first is that the team self-organize. So in theory, there is no, in theory, there's no titles. And when I say this, it gets very difficult because the team, remember rugby, is integrated. So it's developers, architects, designers, testers, are all on the same team. And you all work on the same deliverable together as a unit. So instead of doing a tremendous amount of architecture and design up front, and then handing it off the baton, and then doing a lot of coding, and then handing it off and do a lot of testing, you do a little bit in small increments. Okay? So every two weeks, you're going to have a deliverable. That two-week cycle is called a sprint. And you'll hear me say the word sprint a lot from this point forward. And... Um, you know, a lot of us developers could use some sprinting, myself included, uh, lose a few kilos here and there. But it's, it's the metaphor is that we're always targeting a deliverable. So during each of these sprints, every two weeks, and sometimes a sprint, can, a sprint can be anywhere between two and four weeks. And after lunch, I'll tell you why it's important. It's not important how long your sprint is. That's for you and your organization to figure out. But it is important to keep the sprints the same duration. If you, if you, try, if you choose to do 18-day sprints for whatever crazy reason, then always do 18-day sprints. And there's a reason for that, and we'll talk about that after lunch. That's not important to re even remember now. So your product is going to be your iterative development going on during sprints. The team is integrated. In theory, and here's the part that I find difficult ever to be true, is everyone is a, an, an expert in everything on the team. right? Everyone can be a designer, a coder, a tester, or an architect. We all know that's not the case. Right? We all know that we segment our skills. Some people are better coders. Some people are obviously better designers, because Lord knows um, my design. <laughs> Stick figures, right? Is there, you know, oh, yeah, here we go. I'll show you my design skills. Here's, I don't know if you know much about my company. I find it really funny that I work for a company that's known very well for its graphical design, and I have none. Um, my grandfather, by trade, was an artist. And I got zero of those skills. I got the math skills from some ram, maybe the milkman, I don't know. I got some math skills from somebody. So, in essence, the team in theory is self-organizing, but in reality is the team is going to have probably a tester, maybe a coder or two coders, 
you know, an architect and a designer. So they're going to divide the work up amongst themselves, but it's going to be pretty obvious who gets it. Okay? But the, real, the, the, the thing here is there's no one telling them what to do. Okay? The team even chooses what work to work on during that particular sprint. But it's not like a free fall, like, ooh, I want to work on this particular feature. They're going to work on the things that the business has prioritized. And we're going to talk about that a little later, and then we'll talk about that more in the afternoon. There's also a concept of this thing called a product backlog. And you heard one or two people mention it either in their questions. And the product backlog is very simple. It's a list of all the stuff that needs to get done before you can consider the project complete. Okay? So that is a, I just introduced a piece of terminology, if you're new to Scrum, called the product backlog. And I, I also introduced Sprint. So as I said, it's just the stuff that needs to get done. So it's your work items. Okay, right? if, you use, you know, if, you, if you're using any type of um, you know, issue management tracking system. So bugs become work items. They go into this thing called the product backlog. So the other characteristics is that however you choose to kind of write code and engineer your application, whether you like to use TDD, okay? I don't like DDD, like domain-driven design, but some people do. I have my reasons. We could talk about that offline, why I'm not a fan of DDD. Or FDD, BDD. I like to call it star DD. <laughs> Actually, anyone here, in, I, a couple people from Microsoft, I, I say Microsoft uses CDD. Do you know what CDD is? Who said it? Conference-driven development. Yeah, they, they, they now only release products at conferences, right? So I just say Microsoft should have a conference every week. And they'd be the best software. They'd be Google. Like they, Microsoft's always like, oh, I'm like a Microsoft insider. They always ask my opinion. They go, how do we beat Google? How do we do it? I'm like, just have a, have a web conference every week. <laughs> there you go, CDD. So Scrum doesn't care if you use CDD, TDD, QDD, FDD, star DDD, right? Doesn't care. As long as you're following the principles of Scrum. Okay? Some people even use like a little mini waterfall inside of the scrum, which is actually fine. It's perfectly okay. okay doing a mini waterfall. If, for, if waterfalls, you're comfortable with waterfall, um, that works. The problem with doing this, is a, I'm a little bit ahead of myself, the problem with doing a mini waterfall is you're probably already thinking in the back of your head, well, if, if, we're, going down the unit, if we're going down the field as a unit in scrum, that makes sense if everyone could pick up the ball and run and, and score. But what if, you know, we're designing... What are the developers are doing during the design process? What are the testers doing during the design process? Right? Well, in reality, the testers are working with the designers on what they're doing simultaneously. But then what are the testers doing? Well, the first week, if you're doing a two-week sprint, the first week the testers might be writing the test plan. And let's say the first three days of your actual sprint, they're doing mostly architecture and design. Well, then the developer can start writing some unit tests, right, using a TDD approach. Right? Because they're going, to you know, they're going to know what they're doing. They may not know what the code's going to look like yet, but they sure as heck will know what the requirements are because they're in front of them. Right? And the testers, they can work with the testers building test cases, test scenarios. Right? Might be database tables. The developers could write the testers and collaborate with the testers to write queries to get them data. Right? So there's always work to be done. What I don't like seeing is the anti-rugby scrum, the scrum going down the field with one guy over here and one guy over there and the rest together. And that analogy kind of goes like this, is the developers work really, really hard, and then the last three days of the sprint, the testers are working 18-hour days and the developers are at the pub drinking. Right? No, the developers are, 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 the testers are now kind of in charge giving the developers tasks. Saying, no, help me test. Here's how. Right? Here's what you can do for me. You can write some scaffolding code. You can write some database queries. You can, you can make me test data. Okay? So, you know, everyone's, if someone's working overtime, the whole team's kind of working overtime. So it's a self-functioning like unit in that respect. So those are the, the, the core um, applications. Um, who can't see this slide? Who's like over here on the side? Because this is the fundamental thing for Scrum. If you can't see this, I will leave this. This is the slide I'm going to lead up during lunch. I want you to come up and study it. If you're off to the side, like, peer your head over a little bit if you can. I know this room is not, I know, like, right here, because I've sat in your seat. I know it sucks. You just get up and stand right in front of that guy, because he's not paying attention. Just for a <laughs> So, unfortunately, not everyone can see this slide perfectly, so I'll walk you through it, and I will leave it up um, at the break for lunch, which is still about 40 minutes away. So, this slide I actually ripped off 
Um, and that's why it's a different color, so I remind myself to tell you I ripped off this slide. I ri actually, I ripped off a lot of these slides from my Scrum certification. I've changed them around, but this one I kept intact, so I've kept the copyright at the bottom. So this slide is one of the slides they show you in Scrum School. If you go to decide to get a certified Scrum Master or developer. And here's kind of how it works, because in my opinion, this is Scrum in a, in a nutshell. Or this is like Scrum universe. So you have the product backlog. Who remembers what the product backlog is? Someone, shout it out. Make me happy. I love it. Everyone said the same thing almost at the same time. Exactly. That means you guys are learning. That's awesome. I'm doing my job. Very happy. So it's all the stuff that needs to get done. These are your work items. Okay? So you might have 100 things in this thing called the product backlog. When I first was new to Scrum about, about nine years ago, eight years ago, I did not like the term backlog because it sounds like you're behind, right? Backlog just sounds wrong. I'll be honest with you, I'm still not happy with the term. Screw that Schwaber guy. Um, how come we couldn't say like product prologue? I don't know. Is it called something more positive sounding? It sounds like we're behind. I still, I still fundamentally don't like that name, but that's the name. I've made peace with it, okay? Um, just like I've made peace with Obama as my president raising my taxes. Um, okay, especially for citizens living abroad. We got particularly screwed. Oh, we must take more of your taxes. So, product backlog. Everything that has to get done. Remember the term sprint. A sprint is an iteration. Back to the Agile Manifesto, right? So, Agile Manifesto says we do small iterative cycles of releases. So, a sprint is done every two weeks or four weeks, okay? And what happens is the sprint takes a few items out of the product backlog and puts it into the sprint backlog. Now, I've just introduced a term called sprint backlog. Who can guess for a future t-shirt, a promise of a future t-shirt? Who can guess what the sprint backlog is? And not someone who already knows Scrum, Mr. Green Shirt Man. I will pick on you. Things to be done for this sprint. See me later. I'll give you a t-shirt. If I don't have a t-shirt, I'll give you my... No, I'm not going to give you my rugby jersey. <laughs> it's like $200. I got a free, though. But it's like $200 to buy one. No, I have a, a Telerik t-shirt underneath. So I'll give you this sweaty t-shirt later. <laughs> okay. So the sprint backlog is the stuff that needs to get done. So you, if you have 100 items in the sprint backlog, and you take maybe 10 items into the... I lied to you. You have 100 items in your product backlog over here, for the people who can see the slide. If you take 10 things out and put it into the sprint backlog, during those two to four weeks, you'll be working on those 10 things. Let's say a critical bug shows up. Where does a critical bug go? Into the product backlog, right. And that's a difficult one to swallow. Okay? Unless it's so critical that your company will go out of business or a security hole or lose money, you stop the sprint and work only on that bug, and then you go back to the sprint. Uh, we'll, get, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. I have a slide for that, too. But, um, so your sprint backlog, then you work on this for two to four weeks, and then you, every day you have this thing called a daily scrum. Anyone heard of the daily scrum? Okay, lots of people. Almost 30, 40%, of the, 30% of the room. So every day the team gets together and has a meeting. I hate to use the word meeting because meeting is like saying Pakistan in this room, right? Meeting is like saying the cricket player who blew the game to Pakistan, right? So, or the no air conditioning. Um, meeting is actually a stand-up meeting, and it's not really a meeting. It's where we kind of affirm what we're working on and make commitments to the rest of the team. It's not a status meeting. It's not a, you know, meeting to kind of debug issues. It's a meeting just to kind of let everyone know what we're working on and what we need from each other. Okay, so it's an informational meeting. It becomes very addicting. I'm going to talk about the Scrum in a few minutes, and uh, I'll give you some more detail. It becomes very addicting uh, to the developers. I'll tell a really funny story um, about it, a true story, though, which is good. At the end of this cycle, at the end of the two to four weeks, remember, it's either two weeks or four weeks. It's not either or. It's not like, oh, we planned for two weeks, but we're really taking four weeks. Okay? It's meaning, okay, in two weeks, we're going to deliver these ten work items. What happens if after two weeks, you only complete eight work items? What do you do? Uh, oh, you all said it at once. I didn't, you said different things. In the next sprint. Right. You don't work over... Well, you can't work overtime if you want to impress people. 
but that's going to screw things up for you big time, because then you're always going to be working overtime. Okay? I'll explain that when we talk about estimation. Okay? Meaning if you would commit to 10 but only complete 8, and you had no crazy things like someone got sick for three days or something like that, right? um, then your, your expectation is always going to be 10. Right? If you worked really, really hard. So usually your first sprint, you're going to choose 10 things and only complete 7. You always, almost always overcommit. That's actually okay. But you always take those two weeks if you have two-week sprints. So at the end, those two items go back into the product backlog. Okay? Presumably you'll do them the next sprint, but not necessarily. Because the business resets the priority at the end of every sprint. But I'm ahead of myself. So the sprint is over. You've completed 8 out of 10 work items. You have a, and this not, doesn't have slash, slash to do. Who has that in their code? Or slash star to do star slash. Who has something like that in their code? Today, running in production, like you work at like citibank.com and I'm going on my online banking and I know that behind this web page is a slash to slash to do somewhere. <laughs> Correct? Who's got that in production? Raise your hand, please. Unless your boss is next to you, your hand should be up because we all do that. Okay, so thank you for the honesty. You all people suck for lying because uh, I know you do it. So there is no, so what happens is this isn't like prototype at the end of the two weeks. It is production code ready to deliver to the business. You actually then have a demo of this code and this feature to the business. So if you're building a website and it's an e-commerce website, your first sprint might just be the login page. I don't know, right? I, whatever you think you can do in those two weeks. And we'll talk about estimation, those things, after lunch. So at the very end, you have production quality code. What do you think happens when you give that to the user? Now, we've just done this. We've, I gave you the scenario before where it took us four months to give the user. And this goes back to this lady who I gave a t-shirt to because she was so wise by saying I was right. Um, you know, the first scenario was every four weeks, I'm sorry, Four months, the users get something. What do they say? Feedback. Well, what do they say after the four months? Their feedback usually consists of? <laughs> Goodness, this is like the third time I've done this in India, and it's been the exact same. This is not what I wanted. Can you guess how many times I've done this lecture? Let's just make up a number. 50? Do you, do you, and I've done this in probably 10 to 15 countries. Can you imagine that? Do you, are you shocked or are you, you know, not shocked that it's the exact same thing everywhere? Not shocked. You shouldn't be shocked, right? It's a universal truth, right? It's a universal truth that the first time the users see a piece of your application, they're going to say, this isn't what I asked for, <laughs> right? Yes. So wouldn't you rather do that after two weeks than four months? Right. I'd much rather do that after two weeks. That's one of the reasons why I don't like to use four-week iterations. I like to be annoying to the user. I'm like, oh, okay, it's not what you want. Tell me what you want. I'll do it. This is not what you want, tell me what, and I'll do it. Eventually, they're going to tell you what they want. Because you keep knocking on the door. Okay, I did what you wanted. That's not what I wanted. Okay, let's do it again. Right? So, what will normally happen now, after that first sprint, you've delivered something to the user. It's completely opposite of what they wanted. So, let's review. We had 100 items in the product backlog. We worked on 8, even though we wanted to work on 10. So, we have 92 items left, right? No. The user is going to say, well, okay, um, here's 10 new work items because I didn't tell you what I wanted the first time. So now we're up to 102. And oh, by the way, you generate these three bugs. So now you have 115 items in your work log. This is okay. Everyone's laughing. It, it's the truth. We're laughing at ourselves because this is what happens. That's absolutely 100% okay. That's the purpose of Scrum. First, remember what I, what I said. It exposes your problem sooner. So it exposes the problem that A, developers... Build bugs. We do. We're not perfect. We are human, as much as some people may not be. In the programming industry, you know who I'm talking about, right? Like that guy in the cube who can't make it to the developer summit because he or she is not human. Um, they live on caffeine and Star Wars comics, right? So we make mistakes. That's one of the problems we expose. And the users and the business did not communicate their needs to us properly. That's another problem. But then the third problem is, it's not just that the users didn't get what they wanted, but now that they see it and can click on something, they're like, their world changes. It went from an idea in their head to, you know, something on paper. It's kind of like, anyone ever use an online dating site? 
Come on, you can admit it, right? So what's the first thing you do? You look at the photos, right? And the photo is the idea in your head. And then you meet the person. And then they're like me. They talk too much. You're like, oh, this person's annoying. They talk too much. The sound of their voice hurts my head. <laughs> then you have a whole different idea after you've seen them in person. So it's the same thing here. It's just like online dating, right? The users will then come back to you and say, oh, this is what I really did want. I didn't realize that. Because a lot of times, I've built systems that were paper-based. Or, more recently, I built systems that were kind of like Excel-based, or even Windows-based, right? You know, you have using like either Swing or you're using .NET or something that was Windows-based, and now they're moving it to the web. And let's face it, while the web will take away some of the fidelity and some of the richness, it adds a whole different paradigm, like hyperlinking and all that other stuff. And they don't realize that because they just want, I want the exact same system I had, but on the web. Well, you're like, well, this is an opportunity to kind of change things. And they're not going to listen to us because we don't, you know, we're geeks. We're not business people. Right? But we really do know better. And we don't know better because we're smarter. We just know better because we've done this 100 times. Right? We've seen this process 100,000 times, right? Where you're converting a paper-based or, or Windows or desktop-based system to the web. So now you're back to 115. Now remember when I said, what happens to those two bugs, those three bugs that you created? And someone said, oh, it goes into the next sprint. And I said, right. Uh, but I didn't give him a t-shirt. The reason why I didn't give him a t-shirt because he's always partially right. So we're up to 115 items in our product backlog. At the end of every sprint, after the users have said thumbs up to your product or your increment, then the users go back to the product backlog and reprioritize the entire backlog. Okay? And then the next 10 items, or in reality, 8, because we've proven that you can only do 8 in a sprint. So the next 8 items that you pull out of the, of the backlog might not be the, the eight you thought you were going to pull out when you finished the sprint because they've reprioritized. This is the way to keep the business engaged. And it's also the way to end the battle like you're late. Oh, you didn't tell me what you want. Because the business now feels part of the process because they are. Okay? And you're working on what they want. And they're going to start realizing that at the end of the day, we're building a system and every system has trade-offs. And... You know, the number one problem I have with software is that, you know, the business wants this, and we tell them an estimate, and our estimate is, you know, we double our estimate, then our boss doubles that estimate, and that boss usually doubles the estimate, and even that's wrong, right? Because it's difficult to estimate. What I like about the Agile methodology is that it takes that kind of, you know, problem and exposes it. Remember I told you, right? Scrum just exposes these things up front. So it exposes that, and, it, and in this particular case, it actually does give us a way to handle that, right? which is that the business resets the priorities after every sprint. By the way, that is a agile, um, that, that is true across all the agile methodologies. If we were here talking about XP, which is not nearly as popular as Scrum, it's the same thing, okay? Meaning is that the business resetting those priorities at the end of every iteration is a core tenet of the entire agile process. Okay. Um, Yes, I'm going, to do, I'm going to introduce a couple more terms, or, or in this case, since we've talked about a lot of these already, I'm going to kind of reintroduce or just redefine some of these terms. And then maybe we'll take a couple of questions, and then I'll get into some more of the um, other stuff. So first is the product owner. So we're just going to talk about some of the, we're going to talk about some of the people, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the process. So the product owner is the person on the business side responsible for the product. This is the person, he or she, will set the priorities for the business itself. It will set the priorities that go into the product backlog. At the end of every sprint, they're going to give you thumbs up or thumbs down. By the way, the business can reject your work after those two weeks and ha-ha, back to the drawing board for you. Okay? Or most likely, you know, most likely will accept it because they're getting daily feedback most likely during the daily scrum, which we'll talk about in a minute. So the business is the person responsible. I'm going to be honest with you. They're also the hardest person to keep engaged because they're in charge of the business. The smaller the business, the more difficult this is. Okay? The person might come from marketing. The person might come from product development. Depends on the type of organization you have. Okay? The absolute worst person to be a business owner is the CEO. <laughs> they're busy running the business. right? They can't run the products too. If you're in a business, large or small, where the CEO is consistently the product owner, Give your CV to other companies, in all seriousness. Okay. So then, 
You might have heard me use the term scrum master. It's an awesome title, isn't it? Scrum master. The scrum master is the person who, let me phrase this the right way, instills the values of the agile kind of manifesto and scrum in the team. So they're the person that makes sure everyone's on track, not with the deadlines, but making sure that we're actually having the daily scrum, which we'll talk about in a minute, that we actually have a backlog, that the business is engaged. When the developers have an impediment or a problem, the scrum master runs to action. Okay? So the developer complains, I can't access this database because I need a you know, user account on that domain. Scrum master runs to your rescue. Okay? Developer does not understand a requirement. Scrum master will run and you know, either set up a meeting with the person or find out for you. Okay? Your, your team is working on something that's dependent on another team. All right? The scrum master is the person who will go find this stuff out. They also facilitate a lot of the meetings. It sounds a lot like a project manager, right? But it's not necessarily a project manager. I, I, like, um, I, know, I, don't, I know not everyone can see the slides, but I like the last bullet where it says it kind of shields the team from external stuff, right? I call it like it's, it, it blocks all the BS from getting in your path, right? So the scrum master takes all the arrows, Right? All, the, all the punches from, the, from, the, from both sides, from the business and the developers. The Scrum Master, let's be clear, is not a developer, does not, is not part of the actual team itself, and it's not a business person either. It sits literally in the middle of the two. Okay? If you're in a big organization, the best person to be the Scrum Master is someone who has a lot of political capital. <laughs> right? someone, who, someone who has a lot of friends in the organization. They make the best Scrum Masters. Right? Someone who can go and remove impediments. Someone who can sweet talk the marketing department into getting some copy sooner. Or sweet talk the DBA into getting a database password you know, slipped through. Or, or sweet talking the gosh darn admin of punching a hole in the firewall because you know, the, the developers are using some crazy port. Okay? Who has those arguments? When you're arguing with an IT administrator over which port should be open, you have to stop and ask yourself, time out, how did the business make money after this conversation? I usually do that to the administrators, and they usually tell me to go away. Um, and I go complain to their boss, and they tell me to go away. And then I give up. Okay, so the team. We've talked about the team. The team is usually self-organizing and cross-functional. I told you, the cross-functional part of the team doesn't always happen. Maybe in the future this will happen, when we will have developers able to design. Probably not. Right? However, we might have a designer who's also someone who's skilled with quality assurance and QA, especially as more and more QA gets automated over time with automated tools, especially as you know, things like continuous integration and um, unit testing become more important. But today, it's not necessarily true that they're going to be cross-functional. I told you the optimal size of the team. Uh, you know, the, the Scrum literature says between four and nine. I say between four and seven. Okay. I think seven is about the magic number where human, humans can't really process more than seven inputs. Um, there's this famous guy, I, I went to business school, and this very famous um, business school person wrote a lot of books and stuff. He wrote a paper about that. His name is um, Harry Mintzberg for the uni from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. And he basically... All this, you know, he's a business guy, but he did all the psychological research that humans can only process like seven things at a time, right? So that's part of the argument of why you can only have seven people on the team. So teams are smaller. So someone asks a question, what if you have large teams? Well, we're going to get to that. Still probably another 10 minutes or so. But the teams themselves stay smaller, and you just break them up into functional units, okay? Now, here's a bullet. If you can't see it, I'll bring it up. That usually gets people throwing stuff at me in the audience is the team members have to be full-time. So you can't, how many people kind of work on two different things at the same time? Like, you know, you work on the legacy system and the, not as many as I thought, only about 10 or 20 people, 10 or 15 people. I've been plagued with this product my entire career. I'll tell you a quick story about when um, the company I work for, Telerik, you know, these wonderful t-shirts you've been getting. If you don't know much about us, we sell stuff to you. We sell software developers. So we make money by selling you stuff. So you go to our website, you put your credit card in, and you make me richer. You know what I mean. So here's what happens. I was working on a project, and this dude, Pavel, 
was the guy who wrote the e-commerce engine. Our e-commerce engine was horrible. And Pavel was also working on a new project. And I was kind of assigned to go help this new project kind of get off the ground for the first month or two. So I'm hanging out with them, and all of a sudden, Pavel disappeared for three days. I'm like, where did Pavel go? They said, oh, the website stopped taking orders. Well, guess what? If the website doesn't take orders, none of us get a salary. So I said, okay, I guess Pavel has to top, you know, stop working, and we're kind of screwed, but we have to do it. So while members should be full-time, that's the best case scenario. Okay? Sometimes we're going to be pulled in other directions. We just have to accommodate for that. Okay? How do you accommodate for that? Well, obviously you can't predict that, but when you, assign, when you uh, um, sign up and take things out of the product backlog to work on, you should always kind of have in the back of your head, well, Pavel might have to go and take care of the website for two days, so we should probably take seven things instead of eight things just in case. And if we finish early, what do you do? Do you take another thing out of the work line? Depends. If you finish early, you just finish early. Okay? And then you actually just start the process, you know, sooner. You, you know, it's, it's okay to have a, you know, one week and six day sprint. Okay? If you finished early. So as I said, there might be exceptions. My big one that I put here, database administrators, it's kind of crazy to have a DBA on every team. Okay? But it also is kind of crazy to have one DBA for 100 developers. Right? So, you know, obviously resources and financial, you know, inputs will go into this particular problem. I mentioned before that um, teams are self-organizing. And the last bullet, if you can't see it, is also important, which is that team members need to stay on the team for the duration of the iteration, preferably for the entire project, but at least for the iteration. Now, obviously, if the team member has, you know, if at the very beginning of an iteration a team member has a death in the family or some other kind of emergency, you know, these are, there's exceptions to everything, of course. But as a general rule, is the team member, if they you know, are leaving to another team within the company, it should be after that particular iteration. Very rarely will a developer quit, resign their position in the company to go work for another company in the middle of a sprint. They will almost always resign at the end of a sprint, okay? which means a lot of times when we have to replace that developer, we're starting the next sprint one developer less. Um, that's just the psychology of a developer, right? You, meaning is we don't like to leave those things unfinished. It's just part of who we are. Almost, almost as universal as the, oh, by the way, can you add this when you, when you give the users the, um, the stuff itself. So another piece of terminology we talked about before is the sprint itself. I think we've kind of covered exactly what the sprint does. Okay, right? It's the iteration, the two to four week iteration. So we don't need to go into that. Sprint planning, we talked about as well. So before every sprint, the business and the team get together. The business prioritize the entire product backlog, and the team members take the items out of the backlog. Now, we'll talk about this in the estimation, which comes after lunch, but you might not take all the things in the product backlog that you would think, because let's say you have three things that are high, and you have two things that are very high. Who has that? Who has the high, low, and medium categories? And then gets the phone call from the boss. Can we have a super high category? I tell them, no, just put less things in the high category. Make it a true high priority. There should never be more than two or three things as high priority, I try to tell people. Right? It's just, if you have 10 things as high priority, then nothing's high priority. Okay? That's a general rule of thumb for life as well. Right? If you make your to-do list during the day, and you have a star next to all things that are important, and you have 18 stars, well, you have a problem. Okay? So what will happen is you'll choose, you know, let's say there's two or three things that are high priority, and then there are things that are medium and low. You might only take one of the high priorities for this particular sprint because the other two might have dependencies, right? Which then you'll have to take something as a low, which by definition would become high. Or more likely is you can't overcommit, meaning you only can do, you know, eight. And we'll talk about what these units mean after lunch. But you can only do like eight work items. And you have three things in high priority, but they're, they're estimated to be, you know, six each, right? So you can't, t you can't take two of them because then you have 12, right? You can only take eight units of work out. Uh, if that's confusing, don't worry. I'll explain that after lunch. Question all the way in the back. The existing product manager, pro um, project managers. Um, well, do you want the truth or do you want a story? Existing project managers usually evolve into a scrum master. I've seen that done very successfully. 
I've seen it done very unsuccessfully because they're kind of running around saying, you know, what's your due date in very project manager mode. So successful project managers have evolved into a um, scrum master. And um, to be honest with you, is I'm not sure what then happens if, you, if they don't evolve into the scrum master. So scrum master is a good career aspiration for a project manager that has, um, you know, that has worked at a company that moved from kind of traditional waterfall into scrum. The ultimate responsibility for the deliverable of the first sprint is the business owner. Right? So that's why it's a um, collaborative, met you know, a collaborative methodology. So the business owner is the person. And in reality, the business owner is usually the one yelling at the developers. And yeah, the business owner will probably shout at the developers because it's their butt on the line. Okay? But that will also force the business owner to either embrace the scrum methodology or retract. And, and that goes back to my original comment of Scrum will expose the problems of your organization. You're either going to have a good business owner or a bad business owner. And you'll know that in the first two weeks. Right, there's a lot of finger pointing and things like that. Question here, then I'll, I'll get you next. Can Scrum be used for a fixed bid project? Absolutely. And when I talk about estimation, I want you to think of that question again. Because I didn't really tell you why or how. When we start talking about estimation, you'll start seeing it should fall into place if you, if you do fixed bid work. I actually started using Scrum in offshore fixed bid work. Because I actually found it the best way to communicate and the best way to, to go. Um, real briefly, in a, in a fixed bid environment, let's just say it's a million rupees for the project. And let's just say you, you go, it's, well, that's going to cost you 10,000 rupees a month. So it's a 10-month project. That's 20 sprints, right? So it's a fixed bid work, so to speak. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. We do estimation as well. Question. Who creates, updates, Who creates, maintains, and updates the product backlog? In theory, it is the product owner. In reality, it's the product owner's administrative assistant. <laughs> In small organizations, sometimes it's the scrum master, which is okay. It's okay for the scrum master to do that. But in reality is, if you can get the product owner to do that, then you're, you, like, even if they're paying you very low, you don't want to go work somewhere else. Because that is the best chance of success, the best chance for harmony, the best chance that the product owner will be engaged. Your probably follow-up question would be who maintains the sprint backlog. And in, in theory, no one. But in reality, is the first among equals on the team. Probably like the senior developer will maintain the actual sprint backlog. Sometimes the scrum master does that as well. Did you have another question, though? Yes? Uh, what percentage should we think the product backlog is enough for the product? Excellent question. So the question is, you know, obviously the product backlog can be humongous. What percent do you need in it for it to, act, for you, for you to get going? And we'll talk a little bit about that in estimating. But I say, if you have a humongous project that's going to take five years, don't put anything more than six to eight months into the product backlog itself. So your product backlog at absolute maximum, maybe one year. Okay? Um, the ultimate guru of estimation and planning is a guy named Mike Cohn, who actually is the guy whose slide I ripped off. He's Mountain Goat Software. And I was lucky enough recently to have been approached by his publisher to edit his book. And it's coming out real soon, and that's exactly what he said in the book. He says, you should have anywhere between six months and at maximum one year worth of data in the product backlog. Because, you know, if you're building a project that's two or three years, right, could, if you started a project in the beginning of 1998 and it was for a bank, by the end of 1998, I mean, everything changed, right? You know, banks were being, you know, rules were being changed, banks were going out of business, you know, the whole world was changing in the banking industry. All these new government regulations came about. So if you had all this stuff in the backlog, so much of it would have been thrown away anyway. Another thing I realize and see a lot, and I see this a lot at Telerik as well, is the business owner has these items in the backlog. The team takes items out of the backlog into the sprint backlog. The, oh yeah, I wanted that instead of that or instead of that. When they add, remember my scenario where we had 100, we took out 8, we took out 10, completed 8, we had 92, we added 3, bugs, 95, the business added 10, we had 115. I lied to you, right? So remember, we had 100, we completed 8, 
left us with 92 items left to complete the project completely. Let's pretend we had everything in the project, as to your first question. So we have 92. We added three bugs. So now we have 95. And the business added 10 more items. We should have 100 and 105, 115, 105, right? I lied to you. It's really more like 102. Because usually when the business adds some, they remove some. Because some things are just obsolete. Because now we've, we've done something a new way. Okay? And that's very typical. So that's why you shouldn't fear the change. Because a lot of times it takes that thing that's always been in the back of your head, like, ooh, I don't want to touch that work item because I don't know what we're going to do. A lot of times it magically goes away because the reason why it was crazy and vague in your head was because the business didn't really know what they wanted either. And that's why you've kind of been subconsciously avoiding it. And that's why they've been subconsciously avoiding it. So you want to be able to put in as much as you can into that, into that product backlog. Does that answer your questions? Perfect. Question again. Who will do the performance review? That's a very good question. It depends on the organization and how the organization is set up. It's still OK in this kind of wonderful world to have a development manager, okay? meaning someone needs to make sure the developers come in on time. Someone needs to you know, hire developers, fire developers, do performance evaluations. Um, Developers need to go to somebody and say, I need to take vacation days or call in, you know, call in when they're sick. So most likely your organization will still have a development manager, and that development manager will be part of the sprint planning and will be part of the, um, you know, the overall product backlog planning, more from a resource capacity slash vacation slash new hires, new fires type of thing. Okay? Also, when we start talking, get you one quick second, when we start talking about um, Capacity planning after lunch. We still have a ways to go to lunch, 15 more minutes. When we start talking about the capacity planning, um, what will happen is you'll notice that some developers might, you know, on average do three work items per day or whatever week, whatever it is. The reason why I'm vague about that is because you can define what, how long a work item should last. And the development manager will be like, well, this person consistently will do this type of work and consistently do that. This developer is fast, this developer is slow, et cetera, et cetera. And the development manager will help the teams piece together the right people. So in essence, it would be that person or group of people. Question? Yeah, my question is, could the scrum master play the development manager as well? I would argue in a la the larger the organization, the least likely you'll see success with that scenario, having that person play both roles. Because now they're starting to be more of a technology person and less of in between the business and technology. But in small organizations, that's perfectly fine. I, I ran my own startup at one point, and I was like all three. I was like the scrum master, the development manager, the product owner, you know, until we hired more people. And it worked, more or less. Um, Right? Um, yes. So the question is, you know, the Scrum has all these roles. Will, you know, a very small team, will development manager, Scrum master, product owner be too much? And the answer is yes. In small organizations and small teams, you want to be less formal than more formal. So some people will have to play both roles, right? And we, you know, we used to joke around as um, we had, um, I was part of an organization and we actually made hats. And we put on, like literally made a hat and put on the hat, um, you know, I am now talking to you as, a, as the owner of the company, right? You must work harder or something, right? And sometimes I, I put the hat on like, you know, I'm the scrum master right now. And we, we really went through that process because we were small. We did it more for fun, but we also kept it so everyone remembered that we, um, we have, you know, more roles that were being played. Okay. I'm going to take about two more questions and then I have one or two more slides I want to show. And then we'll take more questions. So is your question, before I repeat it, is your question that who is responsible for saying, you know, this item and this feature, you know, we're going to build a shirt, and the shirt's going to say Hong Kong with a dragon, right? It's a col and you ask, is that collaborative or not? The answer is yes, it's collaborative. It's something to do with user stories, which we'll talk about after lunch. And to be honest, it's a lot on the business side, but it is, it is definitely collaborative. It's a, it's a collaborative um, methodology. Right. 
So the, the question is when you're, when you're building the product backlog in the beginning, do the developers get involved in well? And the answer is absolutely. And when we start talking about the, because remember, the process is going down the field as a unit, even from the early stages. And um, I, I have some very specific, interesting things to, to kind of show you when, um, when we get there. A couple more slides. I'll, I'll finish probably about five minutes before lunch, and, and I'll get take, uh, there, I know there were two or three more hands up. And if I don't get into all the questions, um, we all can run to lunch, and then we'll, we'll be back at 1.30, and I can maybe set aside another five or 10 minutes for questions before we talk about estimating. So here's what a backlog looks like. Looks a lot like an Excel spreadsheet, for those of you who can't see it, because that's pretty much the world's most popular project management tool. Um, followed up by maybe Google Spreadsheets as number two, a distant second, um, then maybe Microsoft Project as third. And um, so basically, it's something like that, right? Backlog item. That's pretty much as, as much you have to do, to be completely honest, right? You don't really need a very sophisticated product backlog, okay? We talked about the product backlog itself already, right? Where it's all the requirements for the project. There's, okay. So then what happens is the managing the sprint backlog. I spoke about this as well, right? The developers will take the most items of priority, of the top priority out and put it into the sprint backlog itself. So I mean, here's just a quick, you know, sample of what a sprint backlog could look like. I personally don't like this. For those of you who can't see it, don't worry, because I don't like it. Um, I don't actually like tracking developer time, partly because I'm a developer, and partly because I know developers lie. And meaning is we always will say something took us two hours, and even if it took us eight hours, and we worked all night long on it, or we Googled something, and it took us 15 minutes, and we say it took two hours because we were you know, Skyping the other hour, 45 minutes, right? It's, I'm not saying that developers are dishonest. I'm, I'm just saying that it's very difficult to keep track of every hour we're accounted for, right? We're, not, we're, we're human resources. We're not electronic resources, right? Electronic resources are easy to measure. It's very difficult to measure a developer. If we are in the shower, how many people have solved a pressing problem in the shower? Yeah. Exactly. Or at the dinner table. Or at the movies. Right, exactly. So it just comes to us in the back of our head. So I don't like, um, I like having the sprint backlog just say, we have these 10 deliverables, this one's done, this one's not done, this one's 50% done, and this starts looking like waterfall to me. Right? So um, while this is part of the official kind of scrum curriculum, I, I usually toss that out. So we talked about the sprints and the changes, and the rule of thumb is there's no changes during a sprint at all. Okay? If you have some massive changes, like, you know, there's a new government regulation that appeared yesterday, or let's say a volcano erupts in Europe, and we're working on an airline reservation system where we're not allowed to give people refunds. But, oh, guess what? You know, act of God, we're allowed to give refunds. Yeah, stop your sprint and accommodate that big change. But other than that, you know, your, your sprint, you've committed to five or ten work items, ten work items, eleven work items, whatever it is, work in those work items. The sprints are kept short, so these things won't pop up unless they're big emergencies, right? And then that's when you stop your sprint. So also, you don't, you know, a big bug pops up, you don't stop the sprint to work on that bug unless the bug is so debilitating, okay, that it's um, going to, you know, put your company out of business, a big security hole, a big hacker, and then it, then it doesn't matter. You know, you pause the sprint, you go work on that bug, and then you kind of come back, okay? Okay, so... Last bit of slides before uh, lunch, and maybe we'll have time. I said we'll have a couple Q&A. Maybe we have time for a couple questions right before lunch. Is the daily Scrum? To me, this is the most attractive part of Scrum, and here's how it works. You've heard me talk a little bit about it before. Is every day, usually in the morning, and we'll talk about that in a minute. You get together, and you stand up, and, there, and, and people tell me, "Well, we do our Scrums over Skype." So I said, "Well, Skype now is a video feature." Everyone stands, because if you sit down, the meeting will take longer. So everyone stands up, and you have a scrum, and you basically let, you know, set a maximum time limit for it, you know, usually 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And you just kind of say this. You say, here's what, I did. here's what I did yesterday, here's what I'm doing today, and here's what I need from you guys you know, on my team to give me in order for me to complete my task. And maybe it's not people on the team. Maybe it's a, a task for the scrum master. Well, uh, if I don't get the database password by 3 o'clock, I'm going to be, you know, pretty much 
Googling for, you know, IPL scores. Right? So that is, that is, in essence, the daily scrum. It's a bunch of, it's the team gets up and talks about what they did the day before, what they did today, and what they, what's in their way. It's not for problem solving. It's not for pointing fingers. Right? It's not for like, ooh, you know, yesterday I was writing, did anyone ever write a stored procedure? Like an insert customer stored procedure? Like how long should it take you? On a table with 10 columns. 10, what? Five, 10 minutes, goodness. I was thinking like five, ten seconds, but no. Not right. It's a short amount of time, right? Five to, five to ten minutes. So let's just say I get up in the daily scrum and say, yesterday I was writing the insert customer stored procedure. Today I'm writing the insert customer stored procedure. What do I need from you? Nothing. <laughs> well, resist the temptation to say, what are you, nuts? Like, is this the stored procedure from hell? Like, come on. Like, you know, what's, what's going on? Have that after the meeting, okay? Because if you do that in the meeting, that person is not going to share their information next time. Right? And they might even stop going to the scrum. Another thing about the scrum is everyone is invited to come to the scrum. But the only people who talk are the members of the team. So the CEO can come. They're not allowed to talk. Try enforcing that. <laughs> Tell them Steve said so. Yeah, that crazy guy in the rugby jersey said you're not allowed to talk. Give him my phone number. I'll talk to him. Product owner can come, but the product owner does not actually participate in the um, daily activities unless they actually have some tasks in the product backlog, which... I doubt they will because they're not because the product backlog is almost exclusively technical tasks. But you might actually put some non-technical tasks in there if there's a dependency. So the product owner, that's actually a good question because the product owner should come because it eliminates the need for any kind of status meeting. It also eliminates surprises. Even because even after two weeks, the product owner kind of gets surprised. Like, whoa, I thought you, you committed to these eight items. What happened? How come only four are done, right? So you eliminate that when the product owner can see what's going on. The problem is, if, you keep, if it's longer than 10 or 15 minutes, the product owner will stop coming. If it's longer than 15 minutes, I guarantee you they'll stop coming. So here are the three questions. Um, you know, what did I do yesterday? What did I do today? What's standing in my way? The scrum master is the facilitator of the meeting, and the scrum master just makes sure, okay, you're done, next, you're done, next. Just keeps it going and make sure that it doesn't devolve into a debugging session, a pointing finger session, or what, uh, oh, we're great session, whatever it is. Right? The scrum master keeps the process rolling, okay? Because the scrum master knows in the back of their head, Phew. okay, so, you know, what went right, what went wrong, what did we learn, you know, from the last sprint? You know, this is usually a 15-minute, 20-minute meeting, right? Everyone can participate in this one, right? Product owner, people not even on the team, right? Marketing people come in and be like, hey, what you guys screwed up, you know, all that, all that stuff. So I am pretty much done with my slides here. Um, this, the sprint retrospective, it is, it's not a status meeting. It's more of a meeting to determine, because the product is over. Meaning a status meeting is every day we say, um, I have 10 tasks, I did eight. And then tomorrow, I have 10 tasks, I did nine. Like that's a status meeting. The retrospective, you're already done. Right? So you're basically just looking back and saying, oh, this, this worked, this didn't work. So you're not really talking about the specific tasks. You're saying, well, you know, we would, we would have done this better if whatever, you know, the network connection was faster. Or, you know, you know we did the daily scrum at 9 a.m. instead of 8.30, and it worked a lot because so-and-so is always stuck in traffic. I mean, you know, literally those are the types of conversations you have in the retrospective. So it's not, it's definitely not a status meeting. The daily scrum is almost like a hidden status meeting. And let me tell you one story, and then I could probably take one question, but I do want to break for lunch exactly at 1 o'clock because I want you all to get your food, and I'm hungry too. I'm starving, actually. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. Actually, then, then we'll, I'm going to tell you the story, then we're going to break for lunch. It has to do with the daily scrum. And remember, I'm leaving this up. If you can't see it, I want you to just come up and take a peek um, in the break. We have 30 minutes at, at your leisure, either before lunch or after lunch. Just come up, and, and I do want you to kind of remember this slide because it is everything about Scrum. So here's the thing. Um, I used to manage a team based in another country, in Egypt, and I was living in New York. So they were seven hours ahead. So we reversed the Scrum, right? So we did it at 5 p.m. their time, like whatever, 8 a.m. New York time, 9 a.m. New York time. So we just, instead of saying what I do yesterday, what I do today, what I need from you, it was more like, here's what I did today, here's what I'm gonna do tomorrow, and here's what I need from you, Mr. Scrum Master, 
and business owner, when, 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 when we're sleeping, here's what I want you to do in my inbox tomorrow morning. So they're um, interesting because they're Islamic country, and their week goes, their work week is Sunday through Thursday, right, because Friday's the holy day. And so I would always work with them on Sunday morning. I didn't care. I, I, so I went from Sunday, you know, I, I did the daily scrum. I was a scrum master. Worked out cool. Everything was great. And I'm pretty diligent because I find, especially in an offshore environment, you know, you meet every day, that communication goes, you get great results. So I'm meeting with the folks every day, and um, in the U.S., we have the holidays for Easter, the Christian, the Christian holiday. And I was taking off on Thursday because usually we have Friday off, so I just took Thursday off, and I was going to come back Monday. So, you know, I told everyone, hey, I'm off on Thursday. And I forgot to tell people I'm off on Sunday because Sunday is a normal off day. So I forgot to tell the Egyptians Thursday that I won't be on the scrum on Sunday. So Friday comes. I'm in Florida with my niece and my nephew, Disneyland, running around Disneyland. It was great. And Saturday comes. We're in wet and wild, running on slides and all this. Sunday, they go, Uncle Steven, take us back to Disneyland. I go, okay. So we go to Disneyland, and my phone rings. Now, I usually don't answer the phone on vacation, but it's like a weird number, and, you know, Sometimes my mother likes to stalk me when I'm with my sister and her children. I don't know why. I think she, I think she secretly wants to spy on my sister and ask me, like, what's going on? What are the kids doing? Are they eating properly? Is, is my daughter giving my grandchildren junk food? I'm like, of course, we're in Disneyland. It's the world's happiest place. So we're online for a ride, Space Mountain, and the phone rings. I'm like, oh, it's probably my mother. Did the kids sleep? Yeah, Mom. I go, Mr. Steven, are you dead? No, I still didn't figure out who it was. I'm like, Mr. Steven, you missed a scrum. You never missed a scrum. Sometimes you're late for the scrum, and your Skype says you're away, but you're never offline. Are you dead? I'm like, no, I'm not dead. They said, where are you? I said, and then I'm like, crap, I forgot to tell them about this, that I'm not going to be in the office. I said, um, I'm not available at the moment. Yes, you are. You answered your phone. <laughs> we need to do the scrum. I said, okay. Let's do the scrum, because I knew it would only be about 10 minutes, right? And I'm online, and I figure, well, this is at least a 20-minute line. I will kill 15 minutes, right? So we stood there on the phone and did the scrum online, right? Now, granted, if the daily scrum was a status meeting, would they have tracked me down when I'm on vacation? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? No, of course not, right? They would avoid it like the plague. They would have a party. Steve's not online. Woohoo! No daily scrum. Right? The reason they tracked me down is because they got addicted to the communication. They almost felt like they couldn't work if they didn't have that, you know, 15-minute conversation. Because I was giving them guidance. They were communicating to me what they did. And, you know, after the scrum, we usually had sometimes a five-minute chat about one of the problems that erupted, you know, during the actual scrum itself. Right? So the other, some of the, you know, the other team would break and two or three would stay on after the scrum and we'd talk about something, right? They, were, they loved that communication. The communication enabled them because they were a high bandwidth team, okay? When I go on vacation, they freak out, right? Because we, well, who's going to be the scrum master when you're gone? For obvious reasons, right? Because it's part of that cycle, okay? So someone said, you know, you know eh, it's a little bit of a status meeting. It's, so it's definitely not. It's just a, it's a way to communicate what's going on. So it is exactly 101, so in 29 minutes, come on back. I will come back about five minutes early if some people have some questions, but I need to go get some food as well. I think we have, I see a colleague. Do we have any t-shirts left? T-shirts are all gone? All right, so I'll bring like five or ten t-shirts for some contests. Yeah, don't, don't let anyone have those t-shirts. change when we're, when we're in process, when we're in a cycle. So the product backlog is a living, breathing document. So at all points during the process, you can add more requirements to the product backlog. 
including when the sprint is going on. You're just not adding it to the sprint backlog. Right. The product owner comes up with the changes for the task when? The, okay. Um, that behavior is discouraged. However, in reality, it happens. So, I mean, the goal is you have a, you have a task that you're working on, and in the middle of the sprint, if you showed it to the product owner, the product owner has a change. That's one of those things where you use your judgment. The rules of Scrum would say, oh, no, no change during the sprint. Well, that's a little silly because you know there's a change. So normally you would try to accommodate for it the best you can. Sometimes it goes back to the question over here. If it's a big change, you stop the sprint and start over. Right? You might be three days into the sprint. You're like, okay, we're done. Start over. And you might have finished a work item or two. That's fine. A lot of times is it might be cosmetic or something very small. You just you know, dynamically add a work item and place it in. Always account for it. So it's really you're going to have to use your judgment in that respect. There's no good answer for you in, in there. Each one's going to be a little different. You mean in your work item process during the sprint itself, uh, no, it does not matter what sequence you do your tasks in the sprint. Because the goal is to deliver the product or the increment at the end. Even though you might have daily builds or use continuous integration of a lot of builds, you're not being evaluated to the very end. So you could work on, how, you know, that's for the team to decide. If you remember when I talked about the team, I said the team was also self-managing, right? So the team will actually decide which items to work on uh, in which sequence. And there's you don't have to work on the highs first, the lows second. You can do however, whatever makes sense to the team itself. Usually they're going to work on the things that will take the longest first, right? And then do the easy, you know, crank out the easy stuff. Okay, question. Oh, great question. So how do, how do the demos work, you know, from a practical standpoint, right? You know, you know do you, you know, demo it per work item? Well, generally speaking, you're going to choose a bunch of work items that, when they're complete, will look like something. Now, granted, sometimes it's going to be something pretty boring, like maybe a login page, or maybe it's something architecturally, like um, I call plumbing, right? Like maybe you're making a service, right? And the service is like a WCF service, or a web service, or a RESTful service. And all you have to do is build the service interface for this sprint. It's, it's a little difficult to, to demo, so you might want to build a quick little client for them to demo. Now, your question kind of led to what happens like, you know, I have eight work items. You know, should, you okay? <laughs> All right. See, if we had air conditioning, he'd be fine. He would not have fallen. He fell on his, he had, his sweaty floor. Everyone's going like this. So you would want to call out the work items. But that's, that gets to the point where, at the end of the day, the business, the business owner will know what those items are because it will be blatant if something's missing. Like, because there's test cases, right? They're like, oh, wait a second. Like, one of the things was email me my password button. There's no email me my password button, right? So, in essence, you could call out each work item and put a checkbox next to them, which is perfectly cool to do. But in reality, it should all just, you know, it'll be pretty obvious to the team. But if it's not obvious, you should call it out. So the question is, you know, do you wait to the end of the sprint to do the demo? Generally speaking, um, yes. But that's, that's not a hard rule, meaning if you want to demo things incrementally, uh, which is perfectly fine to get even faster feedback, and the business owner is willing, by all means, that, that's the value of Scrum, right? Meaning is that's one of the core values of the Agile Manifesto, right? Is to get that feedback as fast as possible, as much as you can go. Okay, I thought I saw, well, you're the other guy who fell. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you had your hand up for a second. But, okay, question here, question here, question here, and then I think... Yeah, you already asked like five questions. Then I'll ask your question, and then we'll move on to estimation. And I'll leave time, of course, at the end to try to get some more questions as well. So I forget my sequence. It was here, 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 here. OK. Short questions, though.
Okay, so in short, the question is, you know, fixed bid, we're adding more work, how do you deal with it? Well, the first, th the first thing, almost turn around back to you as saying is, in, the, in waterfall, it's the same problem. It just happens at the end of the project, right? Okay, you've made my favorite point for me. You said, oh, in waterfall, we do all the requirements analysis up front. Then you get this nice big specification. Then you have a fixed bid. Oh, this is six man months. Is it really six man months? Were those requirements really correct? And that's where we're going to start talking with agile estimation, actually, is when we, when we estimate and when we have our requirements, there's usually a problem with it, right? There's usually something missing. We've misinterpreted it. So with fixed bid, what we always like to do is you have a kind of initial kind of item that says, okay, so this will be roughly X dollars, X months. And, and we turn around and say, okay, so for this fixed bid project, we're going to give you, you know, you've paid for 10 man months and you have this long list of requirements. We estimate we'll get them all done, but we know we're not going to get them all done. We're going to let you prioritize them every two weeks. And usually, I've seen in these fixed bid environments, the two things happen. One is the customer is very happy because they're controlling what's in and out, but they're up front. And we're going to talk about this actually very shortly called the cone of uncertainty. You're going to like that one. Everyone's going to love the cone of uncertainty. The second thing is, what do you like at the end of a fixed bid project? You want more. Give me more, double, like, you know, give me six more months at the same rate, right? So when you, do, when, you do, when you do a fixed bid project using Scrum, the number one person arguing for more budget is your actual customer. They go back to the, the business people and say, oh, no, but I've been adding this and this and this. And they're your number one advocate. So I've actually seen it work extremely well in, in a fixed bid. Government projects where, you know, governments are like, you know, very bureaucratic and very rigid. Works extremely well. So not perfect. Got to adapt. But I, I personally find it much better than Waterfall as well. Okay, I think I had one guy here, one guy here, one guy here. So, yeah, you guys do the honor system. I don't know if you were the original question. So, the question here is, you know, we have to sign the work, and we need to be able to distribute the work properly amongst those developers. We might have dependencies, right? If you remember, the teams are self-organizing, so the team themselves will figure that out because they're the best ones in position. Today, a lot of times we have a development manager saying, you do, especially with Waterfall and Microsoft Project, you, know, you do these tasks, you do these tasks. Well, who's in the better position to do, who, to do that? The developers themselves that know their skills and capabilities or the, the manager? Probably the developers, not necessarily all the time. So, Unless there's major dependencies where maybe a third party needs to get involved, it's usually left to the developers to figure out. Because what will happen is they say, we've chosen these 10 items out of the product backlog to work on. And now, because we have these particular 10 items that we're working on, you know, they've kind of in their head already divided up that, you know, this developer's will work on these two, this developer's work on these two. If there's dependencies, that gets a little tricky, but it gets interesting because it gives us the opportunity for the, um, the business will set priorities, but sometimes the developers have to tell the business, ooh, this one is a high priority, this down here you put, we put is really low, but there's a dependency. So then that low automatically now becomes a high. Right? So that becomes, it becomes a problem because now the business which sets the priorities at every sprint is being told it can't set all the priorities, but usually it's only a handful of work items. Right? Is that it's definitely a, a symptom of a team that might not, um, be as in sync as they should be. And that goes back to one of my very first comments that you know, Scrum exposes the problem sooner. And that team might need some guidance from some either more experienced team, like you know, might come in and coach them for a while, or maybe they just need a more senior developer to join the team who's done Scrum a lot. So it exposes that. So after that first sprint, when they do the sprint retrospective, which was the last thing we spoke about before lunch, that's one of the things that um, can actually take place in the sprint retrospective. Like, oh yeah, when well, we assigned all the work, we didn't take into account the dependencies and this and that. So it's actually absolutely the case. And it's totally OK to kind of you know, get that outside help. OK. Is what? A good question about, uh, though you were out of sync. I didn't call on you. I like, I, you get a point and a, and a virtual t-shirt, because I'm out of t-shirts, for, for being aggressive and, and assertive. I like that. So 
does pairing happen? That's an excellent question. And I never brought this up, but I did mention the very beginning when I talked about teams, and I said, no developer practices are prescribed in Scrum. So if you use pair programming, you could use pair programming in, you know, as part of the sprint. You don't have to use pair programming, but you can. It's totally up to the shop, and it's totally up to the team. Okay? Obviously, there's resource issues. I mean, if, you, if your company won't let you do pair programming, you can't do pair programming. But Scrum doesn't say anything about pair programming. XP does. That's one of the reasons why I stay away from XP, because XP has more rules than Scrum. Scrum has a few rules. I was joking around with you know, the founder of Scrum this morning, Ken Schwaber. You know, he put in all these rules. But in essence, Scrum is you know, very flexible. That's why it's so popular. It doesn't say you have to use pair programming. It says you can or you don't have to. You don't have to use TDD if you don't want to, test-driven development, if you don't want to. OK, question. How, how good is it for the company by letting the developer interact with the product owner and the clients? I think that's the best thing that, that could possibly happen for the company. Being in the street, uh, I mean, uh, with the team members, right? the product owner, I forget the question, I forget what you're saying. Then I will choose that to give it to the product owner. So, so the question is, the, the team has its daily scrum. Are we exposing any internal issues to the product owner that we don't want to? Number one. You need to report to the brainwashing facility because you are brainwashed. You just use bad terminology. You just said expose internal issues to the product owner. The product owner is on the team. Your, your internal issues is the product owner's internal issues. So the product owner needs to know about those internal issues. Remember, Scrum exposes the, the crazy crap, the, external, the internal issues, faster. Right? So that's the whole point of Scrum. The, the whole point of Scrum is transparency. Bring those issues out into the open. Because guess what? If you and I are on the same team, and I say to you, dude, mm, I don't do data access code. That's for you. Indian guys, data access code. You know, American guys, we write UI. Sorry. But you're like, dude, like, you're 10 times better than me at data access. And I'm 10 times better at you than you at. No, nope, it's the rule. That's kind of stupid rule, right? And let's say we're in a Scrum. And now we have to say this in front of the product owner? Do you think we'd work it out on our own beforehand? <laughs> I think we would, right? <laughs> Good question. What if the product owner is an external business guy? Well, ultimately, that means they're paying your salary, and it's their product, right? So in essence, they're still part of your team, and they should know those issues. Now, sometimes there's some issues that might not be perfect for an external product owner. Um, very, very rarely, but there are, there are boundaries, right? And, and my advice is use your best judgment, right? I made a funny example. It's also true, meaning is if you're going to be transparent, a lot of the BS goes away, right, when, you, when, you, when, you're, when you're being transparent. Um, there are cases where when the person is external, there might be just some minor little administrative things you don't want to worry them about, and that's probably okay. But for the most part, if we're arguing over who does the data access layer, Right? Or who wants to sit next to the pretty QA engineer? Um, those things should be exposed. Because the more transparent you are, the less, the less those issues are going to pop up. Right? OK, I think I have one more question over here. And then I, I didn't hear the last part. I heard um, Scrum documents. So the question was, does Scrum prescribe anything for um, requirement documents or documentation in general? And Scrum says very little about documentation, just the, sa just the same way it says very little where um, this lady asked about pair programming and engineering practices. Because in essence, in some organizations, documentation is very important. And in some organizations, documentation, I make the argument documentation is always got some level of importance, even though we don't like to do it, right? But almost always documentation has some level of importance. So Scrum doesn't prescribe, you must have you know, 18 pages of documentation for every 200 lines of code. It lets you decide that. However, it becomes part of the deliverable. So if documentation is important, so a company like mine, a Telerik, where we sell commercial products, 
documentation and release notes and known issue documents are part of the deliverable. Okay? Right? So you're probably starting to realize that in a two-week sprint, you're not spending two weeks writing code. Right? You're probably spending three, four days writing code, which is perfectly fine. Okay? Because there's a lot to go into these releases, right? But it keeps you focused on delivering and delivering that particular quality and that level of quality back. So Absolutely. Exactly. Just to repeat what um, what somebody here just said is that as you are preparing this documentation and your document writer is involved extremely early on, part of the team actually, your documentation is going to be better up to date and easier to produce. Because at the end, if you're doing a little bit of documentation every sprint, and then you have your your documentation is pretty much done at the end. Right at the end of the entire process. Oh, you look like you really want to ask a question. I'm going to make you the last question, then we'll get on to estimation. And, and we should still have time to do. Um, are we doing? Minimal documentation, which means like three or four comments. <laughs> Come on, we're all developers here. <laughs> oh, man. You're asking me questions that I just can't answer. How do you satisfy senior management? Um, buy them presents, send them flowers. I don't know. <laughs> like, at the end of the day, senior managers are still going to be a pain in the ass, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> scrum or no scrum. However, on a serious note, is in order to make scrum work, and someone did ask about scalability before, and um, in order to make scrum work, is the entire organization does need to buy into it, including the senior management. So you can't have you know, the business owner, the product, or the, you know, the, the team all doing Scrum, and then the CEO walking around saying, well, where's my Microsoft project plan? Right? You can't kind of just convert you know, your estimates and everything and then throw it into kind of like that waterfall style thing. So how do you convince them what they're doing? Invite them to the sprint um, review meetings every two weeks. And here's the interesting thing about that. Most managers are used to the horrible process that we've had in the past, which is, you know, every three or four months you get a beta, the beta doesn't work, you go back. Like, let's just quick review how it works, right? You know, if you estimate in your head, ooh, this project might be one year. And in reality, we all know it's going to take about a year and a half then, right? Even if our best doubled and tripled estimate was one year, it's probably going to take one, one and a half to two years. Why? Because the first month of requirements or the two months of requirements, we go, we build our beta, we release that beta maybe after four months. Now five or six months have already passed. They say, this isn't what I asked for, we asked for. So what do you do? You pretty much start over. I mean, we don't, we don't, we do, right? We pretty much do start over when that happens, right? So then that's where that six months went, right? So management's used to that. So now if every two weeks they're seeing working software, they're like, what's going on here? Do you guys take like, you know, a software development pill? Like, Goodness, I'm going to buy the Great Indian Developer Conference because, you know, you guys came home so productive, right? So management is going to be far more um, tolerant of things because they're going to see incremental process. So you start building trust with them, right? And that's important, and I'm going to use that as a segue into agile estimation because while this is my favorite part of the agile and scrum process, it's also the hardest to get the senior management and the management to buy into. And without it, you're going to fail, unfortunately. So everything I just talked to you about is great. The problem is we still need to estimate projects, meaning is when we use Agile, I have a cartoon somewhere. And maybe I can find this cartoon real quick. Um, this is what I call Agile presenting. I'm going to show you things that I wasn't originally going to show you, but it just popped in my head. Uh, let's see. Scrum. Yeah, the scrum. There we go. Here's a cartoon. I know you can't see it. Everyone familiar with Dilbert? Yeah, everyone loves Dilbert. So I will annotate, pointy-haired boss, we're going to try something new called agile programming. And he goes, that means no more planning and no documentation. Back to your question, right? Just start write code and complaining. And Wally or other guy goes, I'm glad it has a name. And then pointy-haired manager goes, that was your training. So in essence, you know, that is a, um, a classic kind of you know, representation where people 
think Scrum, oh, well, actually, if I stand in front of that, it sounds funny. If people think Scrum eliminates the need to estimate or eliminates the need to document. We won't talk about documentation because I consider documentation like engineering practices, right? Meaning the, the fundamental question, are we pair programming or are we not, varies by organization and Scrum doesn't care. Just like the fundamental question of how much we document, Scrum doesn't care as long as if you require documentation, it's part of each, it's each deliverable. It's not, you, don't have a, you don't have a documentation sprint at the end, right? Okay. So, however, estimation has to be done in a pretty uh, different fundamental way. So the first thing I'm going to do is commiserate with all of you. We're going to spend five minutes or so whining. So I went to Wikipedia, and I lifted the definition of estimation. And it basically is a really amazing concept, right? It says, estimation is the calculated approximation of a result which is usable even if the inputs, am I saying it right? If the input data is incomplete or uncertain. So think about that. We're making an estimate. By definition, it's not accurate, right? It's not precise, OK? So the problem is that in organizations, even in agile, agile organizations, estimates become unbreakable. They become gospel, legend, right? Even if, like, the whole world falls apart. I'll give you an example. Anyone here old enough to remember the dot-com craziness? You know, 11, 12 years ago? So I worked at a dot-com. I got, they were a customer of mine. And I sold my, they were about 15, 20 people. Pretty, pretty famous company for so small. And I sold my company in 1999, and I went around firing customers because I sold my company. I was like, done. Right? I was going to start my own dot-com. I don't know, like sell fans over the internet to Indians. I think I would have done pretty well, especially ones at computer conferences. So I'm going to start, you know, fans.com. And I fire one of my customers. I say, whoa, whoa, time out. Why are you firing us? Like, we really need you. We're going to go into all this venture capital, blah, blah, blah. Turns out they said, oh, be our CTO. I said, OK. So I went to be their chief technology officer. Big mistake. But it was fun for a while. We raised 36 million US dollars. We went from 15 people to about 200 people, back down to like 50 people during the boom and the bust. So in the middle of the project, we were using Waterfall. In the middle of the project, we laid off half the team. And the CEO said, you know, we had a deadline. Let's say, I think it was December 31st. We had a December 31st deadline. And the CEO goes, so we're going to still make that deadline, right? It's like, we just laid off half the team. I said, OK. Well, if we're going to lay off half the team and still make the deadline, we need to cut half the features. No, we need all the features. Well, obviously, there's a problem, right? Because we had an estimate. But that, that deadline became poof, hard. Now, we all know the rule, right? There's quality. Time and features. Did I say that right? No. There's money, features, and time. You can't control all three. You can only control two. You're laughing because, let me guess, you've had this conversation 100 times with your superiors. Is that correct? <laughs> and they say to you, I don't care. They say, get it done. Like, you, ha you have the conversations with these people. And then they turn around and be like, like OK, yes, you know, money. Features, time. So it's six months. We have this many rupees in the budget and this many features. And you come in and say, it's impossible. I said, OK, great. So it'll be done in six months, right? <laughs> How many people had this experience? Everybody, almost everybody. You haven't. You're lucky. You should stay at your job. No, you, Mr. Looking This Way. Yeah, you didn't raise your hand, non-voter. People like you put Bill Clinton, George Bush, and Obama in power. <laughs> OK, so here's the thing. You're called into the manager's office. You're like, dude, here's my project. So they give you like a five minute verbalization of fans.com. And they say, what's the first question they ask you when they're done with this amazing product they want to talk to you about? What do they ask you? How long, when can you have it done? How long will it take? So you, as a smart, enterprising young developer, and your head is like, ah, three months, no problem. So what do you say? Six months? No, you don't say that. You say between six months and 12 months. Right? You hedge. You give them an estimate of between 6 and 12 months. What do they hear? What do you hear? This is the fundamental problem. So 
This is a universal truth, okay? Here's another problem I have with estimates, and this is a fundamental problem. If you get this question correct that I'm about to ask you, and your organization does what I say, you don't need to go to Agile. You're, you're working perfectly fine. And I'm serious. You're working perfectly fine with Waterfall. You don't need Agile. Problem is, no one's going to get the, You might get the question right, but none of your organizations do it. Here's our mythical scenario. We have one, we have, we have our high level, this gentleman was talking about Waterfall. I'm going to pick on him. One month for design, four months for coding and development, one month for testing, six month project, right? Who's ever had something like this? Okay. What? On the paper, of course. So here's what happens. Your first estimate, the, instead of one month for design and architecture, it takes five weeks, right? So what do you do? You now go to the boss. Oh, boss, we're one week behind. What do they do? Do you A, do three months and three weeks for development? Ah, oh, just make it up. Now you have better documents. Of course, you can code faster. So what do you do? Someone tell me what they do in their organization. What? <laughs> Most likely, you're going to say finish it at the same time, right? Who's, who will beg and plead and say, can you add one week to the schedule? Because they were a week behind. No, who will do that? Meaning, who, will, who, who would, how much time would you add to the schedule? How many months for development? What? Approximately the same as was off. Someone said the magic number. Say it again. How many months for development or weeks or whatever? Five months for development. Don't laugh. You blew your first estimate by 25%, which means minimum you're going to be 25% off your estimate for development. Who does this? OK, and you need one person. You guys get A plus. You can leave now. I'm, I'm, I'm being sarcastic, but at the same time, is you guys are a step ahead of the rest of the universe. You're lucky, because very few people buy into this. Now, in essence, agile estimation takes a cue from this. This is, what was, this is why waterfall is wrong. If someone wants to know the problem with waterfall, it's this slide. It's this scenario I just walked you through, OK? Is if you don't constantly re-estimate because of Reality, not because developers suck and are slow in this. It's reality comes in. The estimate, you know, the initial requirements were incomplete. Business changes, right? Yeah, who works at a business that never changes? Like maybe a dentist office doesn't change that much, right? But you know, business changes all the time. So in essence, this is why waterfall has failed. And if I remember my slides, which I don't, because I was. Well, this is, a, this is the answer, so we already know the estimation problem, right? Meaning, this is the slide I wanted to bring us to, the cone of uncertainty. I like that. If I just stay here, it's going to annoy the crap out of all of you, right? But I'm cool when I'm here. OK, the cone of uncertainty. So I did a, um, what are they called? Uh, a fire starter event, which is like a one-day event. We did it in New York City about a year ago, which was kind of like a code camp or a one-day user group meeting. And we did it on Agile, and I was assigned to, well, first of all, I did the welcome because I said I'd wake everyone up at 8 in the morning, which I did. But then I did, I did this talk. So we drink. Well, that's pr pretty lame because you're not going to get drunk. But you know what I mean, right? It's like drinking games. Like, you know, um, ever see the Smurfs? No one saw the Smurfs? That's dating myself. One guy. So every time they said the word Smurf, we would drink. Because right? they always say Smurf this, Smurf that on, every, on everything. So they tweeted, they tweeted, new drinking game. Every time Steve Forte says the words cone of uncertainty, we take a drink. <laughs> Because I'm going to use the cone of uncertainty um, over and over, over the next you know, 30 minutes or so that we have together. Is that correct? We only have 30 more minutes? Goodness. Time flies when you're having fun. Don't you worry. We'll get through all our estimation material. So here is the cone of uncertainty. Everything I just described to you, from the initial project failing, you know, because we have developments, and then we have take six months. Oh, by the way, and then we go back to the drawing board, all that stuff. Okay, Everyone knows this. So you can walk into management and say this. OK, let me take a step back. How many people have woken up in the morning and said, today we are shipping the software? <laughs> and then did not ship the software. <laughs> there we go. And then woke up the next day. 
Today we're shipping. I need it. You look in the mirror, you're combing your hair, you're like, woohoo! I'm gonna go on vacation when this is over, and didn't ship that day either. <laughs> okay, so what does that mean about your estimate? That at 9 a.m., you're estimating at 5 p.m. you're gonna ship, and you don't even come close. <laughs> By definition, an estimate is uncertain. Somehow the business forgets this. However, here is the magic bullet. The business has had years and years and years of late software. Use that to your advantage. Show them the cone of uncertainty. Here's the cone. The cone of uncertainty says the following. When you come up with an initial estimate on a project, when it's just like, hey, I want to do fans.com, and I estimate it's going to take one year, your initial estimate is off by a factor of four, plus or minus, meaning it could take three months or four years. It's true, though. I, I'm actually, will refrain from telling a joke for the next two minutes so we all know how serious I am about this. So at the initial phase of your concept of your application, this is your baseline, which means the only time you're certain is when you actually ship, like when you click the button and says, okay, we're live and productive. Even then you're not certain, right? Because sometimes you take it down after a few hours, right? <laughs> okay, so as you get more information, as the requirements become more realized and as the development team matures, et cetera, et cetera, at each phase of the project, you have more information and your estimation gets good. The cone gets narrower, meaning so, you know, at the... When you now when you have kind of like the project approved, because you know, usually there's a, a project idea, and then you have to go through like, oh, let's get it approved and get a budget, right? You refine the project. Well, now statistics tell us that we're only off by a factor of two. That's better than four. Still sucks, right? Because it could take six months or two years. But hey, we've gotten better. Three months or two or four years, right? Then when you start collecting the requirements or off by a factor of one-third about, okay? So meaning is when you have your initial estimates, you can times it by four or times it by 0.25 to get your range, okay? Management will understand this because A, it's rational. Not all managers are rational, but it's rational. But B, they've lived through it over and over again, okay? Meaning this is just common sense. So I say is in agile estimation, you're gonna use the cone of uncertainty to your knowledge, to your, to your benefit, okay? So let's see how we can probably, how do we do this? How do we accomplish this? Okay, so the first, our estimation throws the logic of an estimation away. It says we're gonna re-estimate the project after every iteration. So if you remember nothing from the afternoon, remember in the morning, right? Scrum is an agile methodology that stresses communication. All right, all A pluses. Afternoon? Re-estimate your project after each iteration. Your estimates will get better and better. And I'm going to show you techniques of how to do it. Okay? Different value system. Oh. Different value system where, you know, changes are not, you're not penalized for changes. You're almost rewarded for a more accurate, um, a more accurate estimation. The good news is after a few iterations, it becomes very simple to do. In addition to being simple to do, it, you've built that trust. Because in the very beginning, managers will say, I can't write you a blank check. I, I, that's the exact words they're going to use, at least if you're in the States. That's, a, that's the, the jargon they would use. I'm not going to write you a blank check. Right? However, after two or three iterations, they're going to see how the process works. And there is a science to it. And we'll get to that science um, momentarily. So this is how you do it. And let me just look in my bag. My phone's ringing. Let me just take a quick phone call. No, I'm just joking. I'm getting a prop. OK, so this is the way you do estimation in the Agile universe. So the first, we're going to go through user stories, something called planning poker. Then we'll talk about story points, the backlog, velocity, and ultimately re-estimation. Got about 30 minutes or so to get through it, which I will most certainly will. First is user stories. Instead of writing requirements, the business owner will write user stories. And it goes something like this. I don't think I have a user story on my deck. Maybe I do, actually. Nope. Um, a user story goes something like this. I 
as a role that you've clearly defined. So I, as a persona, like an administrator, a, you know, whatever it is, right? A customer, a return customer, a angry customer logging a complaint, in a role, want to do the following. And they write a short paragraph. Traditionally, this was done on an index card. And this is your user story. And they write one for pretty much all your requirements. That's how requirements gathering is done inside of the agile kind of universe. Now, it's not simple. Most likely, your users are going to write what we call epic stories, stories that are too long. Okay? That's, a, that's a consequence of doing it this particular way. What does your user story also become for your tester? Use case. Exactly. Exactly has become a use case. So, this isn't, so all of this stuff in Agile does come from our inheritance that we've done before. It's not as radically new as we think it is, right? So it becomes a use case. As part of the user story, and this is the key point, it's difficult for them to do this at first. As part of the user story, the um, user will write acceptance criteria. Okay? So that becomes pretty easy to test now, right? Because now you have, not only do you have your use case, you have your scenario to actually test for. Your user story should be kept kind of small per functional unit, just like you would have a functional point on each, you know, on each particular item. User stories are usually done on index cards or in Word documents, wikis, or, or other types of tools. Okay? So that's a user story. Us as developers don't really write user stories. I'm not going to go too deep in them. At the end, I can give you um, the gold standard book on user stories that um, you should give to your users if they're not writing you good user stories. But once you have a user story, you need to estimate them because not all user stories, um, not all user stories kind of are created equal. So I remember somebody asked a question, when you get to estimating, when you get to the product backlog, because ultimately we're going to go from user story to product backlog. Okay? And we're going to estimate it along the way. So we're going to do an estimate. But we're going to do estimates as like kind of hard, easy, medium. We're not going to say one hour, three hours, because throw that out the window at first. So I have a question. Has anyone here played planning poker? Okay, handful of people. Does anyone else, does anyone know what planning poker is? Okay, only, only a few people. So let me take a step back. Who would want to be on a team with me? Oh, you say this now. OK, so when we're planning, do you think that this scenario could possibly happen? Must build this feature. Let's, how long would it take? And I say, that's an easy feature. Only an idiot would do it in less than an hour. And in your head, you would think it's going to take three weeks. How many of you would stand up to me in the meeting? OK, honesty, I appreciate it. How many of you would probably re-estimate on the fly and say, uh, Steve, I think it's about at least a week? OK, a lot of people, right. So I'm a dominating personality. I tend to dominate conversations. I tend to intimidate. I tend to bully. It really sucks to be in a planning meeting with me, OK? I've done something as anchoring. I went to business school, and I took negotiation. You go into the tuk-tuk driver, and you say, how much to go to the hotel? And he goes, 300 rupees. And you really know it should cost like 30. But now you're like, oh, crap. So what do you say? All right, 100. What are you going to wind up paying, right? You know, you're going to pay a lot more than you thought, because he anchored very high, and you've, you didn't stick to your guns. You didn't say, you know, you didn't start really, really low. When, I, when people come to China, because I, I live in China, I give them the advice. I said, if they say this is going to cost 100 yuan, which is the yuan is their currency, their rupees, I say, bargain with 10. <laughs> and, and they're going to laugh at you, right? The, the, the merchant is going to say, ha, 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 make me a serious offer. Then I say, tell them 11. <laughs> I say, take 10% of what? Because they've anchored so high. You have to anchor low, and they'll, and they'll, they'll come down, and it always happens. So let's say um, you want to sell your house. I'm picking on you because you're the scrum expert. You're going to sell your house, and you put an ad in the newspaper, 1 million rupees. And I come up to you and say, no, I'm going to give you 800,000 rupees. What am I going to pay for his house? 
900,000. All the research says that. We meet in the middle. This is great for bargaining with tuk-tuk drivers. This is great with going to the Silk Road in Beijing. This sucks for software development. So we have a way to mitigate this problem called planning poker. Is everyone gets a deck of cards that are color-coded. So I'll get purple. Someone will get orange. Some other people will get whatever color this is, off green. And we'll sit and play planning poker. And a question will come up and we'll say, how long should this feature be? And I'll go, you know, here's my vote. <laughs> right? And here's your vote. So, and then we say, show the cards. <laughs> However, what has it done? Forces the conversation. Right? So you go and have a planning poker round on the user stories. So what will happen is your user stories get dissected. A lot of times, you'll have to go through two or three planning poker rounds. But you've eliminated the bully to initially kind of say, oh, only an idiot would do it in one hour. I've, I've not intimidated you. And now I'll be like, wait a second. I put this as a one. You put this at 100. You know, why are we off? Okay? And actually discuss. And they're like, oh, yeah, I didn't think of that. Or a lot of times is you're thinking as this as a developer because the developers vote, the business owner votes, the testers vote, the designers vote, and the testers like, whoa, hold your horses. This may be one line of code, but I got to test this on Safari. I got to test this on the Mac. I got to test this, 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 this. Wine, wine, wine. But they're right, right? So that's what you do with planning poker. Notice I have numbers on these cards. I actually don't like these particular planning poker cards because they have numerical numbers, and I think numerical numbers is not what you want to use, because I prefer to say super hard, hard, medium, easy, super easy. Because we're not concerned with, this makes me think of hours, days, right? This makes you think of some kind of, and we're geeks, we tend to be good at math. I keep telling my girlfriend this. So by definition, like, we're good at math. That's why developers don't gamble. Right? We've figured it out. We've walked into the casino. The casino has big columns, expensive rugs. Like We've worked the math. Yeah, duh, they win 51% of the time. I stay here long enough, I have no money. Right? So what happens is I prefer to use planning poker cards that are like this. Um, and by the way, planning poker cards, like, like almost every time you go to a conference, you can find a deck for free um, from a vendor. Um, if not, there's planningpoker.com. Or you can just all pull up a web browser and do it. Or you can make your own cards. Right? So they're real simple. You can buy cards. Um, I actually bought these cards for the Agile Firestarter. When I did the Firestarter, we actually, it was a small group, so we did labs. And I walked around. I gave them all a, an actual user story. I said, estimate this user story with planning poker. And I gave everyone a persona and everyone a role. And it's funny because I, I actually think I even have the slide. Once again, I'm Agile presenting, showing you stuff I'm not supposed to show you. Um, I pulled up a slide. Shows agile file starter. Agile. Um, this was the lab I gave them. They broke them into six groups of five people. They defined the roles. We had two big users. Uh, by the way, I call this the Halloween template to the person who gave me the template. Um, I don't know if you have Halloween in India, but it's a Halloween is in the states a holiday that is all orange. Right? We had team members, QA, they said, we work at Expedia.com. Ever know Expedia.com, right? travel website? And of 20 million customers, you were doing an add-on for the customer service team. Do a planning poker for this user story. As a customer service representative, I can search for my customers by their first and last name. Sounds pretty simple. That is the most basic of a user, user story. Okay? And I had them break up into labs, and it was pure comedy because... I said, how did you go from 20 to a 2? Like, I, I was overhearing people shouting, you know, let's do it again, right? Or do you want me to take the card back, right? Or I heard the second time we were supposed to be closer, not further apart. So planning poker is not an exact science, but it is a way to facilitate the process, OK? So you're not going to get through everything, but it's a way to alleviate the pressure. So assumably speaking, you have some kind of consensus. Now what you need to do, and this is very difficult, is you need to kind of close your eyes. Not now, but when you're at the desk. You close, or you can close them now. It might feel, might feel cooler. Close your eyes. And you know, maybe when I'm not over here, I can let the fan blow on you guys. 
There we go. How does that, how does that work for everyone? So you close your eyes, but I'm putting it back when I walk over there. You close your eyes and you say, let's think of something that we know how long it takes. Right? Meaning is something we know takes some unit of measurement, whether it's one hour or one day. Sometimes we use one day, sometimes we use four hours, sometimes we use one hour. It doesn't matter. So we know that this team can build a blah, blah, blah in one hour. Or we know that this team can build a blah, blah, blah in one day, whatever it is. You break up your stories into story points. One point is that initial frame of reference. Got my drift? So it doesn't matter what it is. If it's one hour, one day, one week, one month, one year, well, those get crazy because we do two-week iterations. So your story points become relative to your baseline. Follow me? All right, so you declare a baseline. That baseline is whatever it is you decide, one hour or one day. And you break your user story into story points. So functional tasks. These become the actual developer tasks. And they have a number next to them. Right? And this is where you do the story. This is where you do planning poker again, potentially, but with numbers now. But it's not four hours. It's this is four times harder or four times more complex than our base. If your base is something that should take you one hour, in theory, if it's four times more complex, sure, it'll take four hours to do. But you're not thinking that way. It's a relative scale. Got me? So we're not just saying, you know, traditionally we sit in front of Microsoft Project and break things down by this takes four hours, this takes three hours, this takes eight hours. So we throw that logic out of the window. Wow, that just moved. That's pretty cool. So we throw this logic out the window. And we say, break things up as a, not as a, a temporal value, okay, but as a value of subjectivity based upon what we already had. Question. If all 10 things are dissimilar, that's perfectly fine. Keep going. I have what? Oh, then you create a base, meaning is if you have no benchmark, create a benchmark in your head that you know the team can do. Or if, you, if, this, team, if this team is the first time they've ever met each other, the company is a startup, do something. Seriously, right? Do, like build a login screen, like do something as a team and see how long it takes and then do it that way. That's the extreme case. But, you know, create some kind of baseline and then compare everything against that baseline. And that's how agile estimation works. Now granted, your estimate is not going to be perfect. We know this, right? By definition, estimations are wrong. But you have your story points now. So what you do is you put all your story points into the bucket. This bucket is the product backlog. But those story points have numbers next to them. Some story points are one, some story points are three, right? Or, it's, or more importantly is your, some item has, is assigned three points and two points or one point, things like that. So now your backlog contains these story points and it contains a numerical value, which is an estimation of, you know, in reality, yeah, sure, we could always bring that back to time, but we don't care about the time at the moment. And, it has, and now you start prioritizing it. And the business sets those priorities. Along with the, the developers and the, and the technical team. Because that's where dependencies will get discussed. Right? So certain things might have to go on a higher priority because there is a dependency. I always get the question, you know, what about things that don't have a user story like auditing? Or you know, um, security, performance testing. Well, those get worked into each individual estimate. Which is sometimes hard to do. Which is why estimates aren't perfect. But it's better off to estimate, those, estimate each item with that built in, performance testing, auditing, logging, tracking, security, that kind of stuff. Okay? Sometimes it's impossible, depending on the type of system. And you'll have to just create a user story for something that's technical. But I try to, every time you make a user story for something technical, always say in your head, ooh, this is probably wrong. And then think about it more. I mean, it's OK to do it, but don't, don't abuse it, so to speak. So, the backlog is now built with the story points. We've estimated it. We've played some planning poker. And we do our first sprint. If you remember my story, what happens in your first sprint? You take out 10, 10 points, and what happens? Yeah, you do 8. That's OK. Because developers will commit to x. They will always overcommit, always, on the first sprint. But at the end of the first sprint, 
you know how many story points can be done. So if you have, you know, 100 work items in your product backlog, and each work item, well, let's just say it wasn't, you know, equals 400 story points, right? At the end of, at the, at the end of sprint one, those eight items might have been worth 24 story points. You know you now roughly can do 24 story points per sprint. Got me so far. That's what's called team velocity. Very important concept. The velocity of a team is the number of story points completed per sprint. So it's the average. So you calculate velocity to predict how much work you could commit to in subsequent sprints. So as long as your story points have a fair amount of accuracy to them, which is why we keep it small and why we compare it always to a base, your velocity is going to be pretty accurate. So if over time, your team has a velocity of 32 story points, this will self-correct, okay, as each, as you do one sprint might be, your first sprint you might do 20, your next sprint you might do 40, then you might start doing 32, 31, and then eventually it's going to level off. Usually takes about three to six sprints, depending on the team's experience, not just their technical experience, but the experience they've had with each other. Also, turnover affects velocity. If you replace a, remember, I, I talked about this before, if you replace a fast developer with a slow developer, you should, your velocity number is going to suffer and change, okay? So, you calculate the team velocity over regular time periods, okay? So, okay. I'm, I'm being so generous, giving you my fan. Um, so, here's what happens. Let's just say your backlog, when you add up all the, I'm sorry, when you add up all the story points, comes out to 400. And let's say, on average, you're doing 50, oh, it's so, math is so hard, 40. You're doing, your velocity is 40. You have 400 things in the backlog. You do 40. How, how long should this take, this project? 10 sprints. If sprints are two weeks, it's going to take 20 weeks, right? Six months. What if you also add 10, an average of 10 story points every sprint? That's a longer formula. I don't expect you to do it in your head, but yeah, you get the point, right? You can start making estimates. Remember the cone of uncertainty? Now you're using it to your advantage. At the end of the first two or three sprints, you can start telling the business, yeah, I think we're going to be done based on the velocity and based on the current backlog and the sum of all the story points in the backlog divided by team velocity times the sprint length is how long the project should take, plus or minus 50%, because we're here in the cone of uncertainty. Right? So let me say that again, because that was a... In my head, it was complex. I made it up as I was going along. One quick second. If I was the business user, I would tell you, increase the velocity. And if I was a developer, I would say, give us more teammates. Right? So there's always going to be the tension between the business and the developers. And he brings up an excellent point. That conversation will show up. Why is your velocity so low? Right? And that is Scrum and XP and Agile does not have an answer for that. Right? That, is, that is one of the values of Scrum is having that conversation sooner rather than later. But it's also one of the things like, well, OK, let's compromise. We'll try to do something faster at your sprint retrospective. And we'll see what we can do in the next sprint. And then at the next sprint, if your velocity goes up by one, OK, and you know, the management's attending to daily scrums, eventually over time, there'll be a compromise where they'll say, mm, you know, without other factors, you know, the velocity won't go higher or lower. Also, if you're in an organization that has implemented this for a little bit of a while on a number of projects, they can have that conversation where they say, well, your velocity's 30, and this team's velocity's 80. Well, then the development team might have some problems. Maybe they need some coaching, or maybe they need some better developers on the team, whatever it is. But if you're only one team in one organization, it's going to be a difficult conversation. I, I agree. And so Scrum does not fix that problem for us. Okay? So hold on. Let me just repeat that formula again. Right? So the way you estimate when a project is going to be done is you take total number of story points. Let's just say it's 400. Divide it by 
the team velocity, let's just say it's 40. So we have 20, it's between you know, eight months and two months. Or, you, know, you would kind of do something like that. But as you get closer and closer, that estimate becomes better and better. Okay? So that, in essence, is um, how the process works. I know you have a question, but give me one more second. So I just want to show you the, um, what a velocity chart looks like. Okay? And it's very good to graph this and show this. This goes back to the transparency of Agile, is this should be posted on the door of the development team. If you use any automated tools, this should be like on a plasma screen when you walk into the office. Okay, right, is the, the team velocity and the burn down chart, right, of how things are going. So last, I have a question here, to, and then I'll get to you, because I have one last slide that I want to go to before I get into some of the questions, and then we'll kind of wrap it up, is, and I kind of already made this point, right, as you complete more sprints, your velocity will change. As this gentleman said, you know, management's going to kind of be like, increase your velocity, and you'll try. I mean, you know, we will, we'll give it the old, you know, the old try. But as I said, between three and six iterations, everyone, including management, is going to accept what your velocity is, unless there's some major changes to the staffing of the team or, or you had some pretty bogus estimates already to begin with. Right? So you re-estimate the entire project after each sprint. So every two weeks, you're having a new estimate. And at first, management's going to be like, this is crazy. But when you start you know, using the cone of uncertainty, and when you start you know, getting some accuracy and you start delivering stuff. They're, and then eventually, here's the beauty. Eventually, at some point, the estimates go in the, in the good direction for management. Right? At some point, you're saying 20 weeks, 20 weeks, 20 weeks, 20 weeks. And all of a sudden, you're going to turn around and be like 18 weeks. And they'll be like, right? Because then they're going to realize you can go both ways. Okay? So that, in essence, is um, the estimation. So I had a couple questions. It's about 10 minutes to go. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about agile and offshoring, but I already took... Basically, that was the Egypt story. <laughs> In all seriousness, right? Is um, agile, but I'll say that but I had a couple questions. So there was one here and one here, and then it's a free for all to whoever I see first. So who was the question that was over here? Was it you who asked a lot of questions? I perfectly okay. I don't think it was you. I think it was someone over here. But is it the assumption that all the story points are of the same size? One story point represents your baseline. Get my drift? So if your baseline was four hours, or you know, remember, remember the baseline is not an hour temporal value. It's a thing you've built, right? So the baseline was um, you know, a login screen. So your baseline, that's one story point. And everything else was, oh, this is two times harder than the login screen. This is three times harder. This is one time, this is two times easier. So you have a half a story point, two story points. So yes, in theory, story points represent the same level of complexity and the same effort of work. That's not going to be perfect. You're absolutely not going to be, you know, you're not going to get that. You're not going to be perfect. So the element of time only comes in after you finish the first sprint. Yes. And it's almost a bad thing to introduce the element of time, but it's impossible not to. Right, because your velocity, now basically, it's pretty easy to figure out, well, if I do 32 story points, and we worked you know, eight hours a day times this many days, you can kind of figure out how many hours a story point is. I prefer to just use, just always work in the abstract, saying we have 400 story points, our velocity is 40, our sprint length is this, you know, this is what it is, and we'll be finished you know, in six months type of a thing. However, it is literally impossible not after that first or second sprint to start introducing time. It's not a bad thing. I just prefer to keep the spirit of I have a baseline, and that baseline in theory, and you know, you know in your head that baseline might have been only four hours, but I like to try to keep it as separate as possible. It's hard to do. I know those questions here, but I promised you a question. So perfect, perfect comments, last question. How different is this from you know, function point analysis or you know, you know, we have use cases? The answer is not that much different, right? And if you remember my first slide when we started doing it and I had to quiz. I said, you know, who adds, four, you know, who adds one month to the development cycle? It's, it, there really is no difference. It's just this is how we estimate in Agile. Most of the things from Agile have been inherited from previous stuff, just tweaked a little bit and moved around. So it's not tremendously different. The good news. If, if your organization is moving to Agile and you've had people who have been practitioners 
in function point analysis and other things, they'll buy into this much quicker than someone who's never done that type of stuff. So use that to your advantage if you can. When you say team velocity, yeah, team velocity is, is, is another, another way of measuring performance of the team. Right. Is, is it from? Team velocity is for, your, for that project. So here's an interesting point. Someone said management's going to say to you, increase your velocity. And I guarantee you they will. Even if your team velocity is like superhuman, they're going to say faster, 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 right? So here's the problem is that I said one of the things that might happen is the, the team velocity that you might be compared to another team. The problem is what if the other team chooses a different baseline? Or the, what if the other team is five developers, your team is four developers? So it, get, it is a subjective thing that's really only a good unit of measurement for that particular project and the sprints you're on. There, you can use it as a guide for things that happened in the past, but in essence, it's only going to be good for that. Is what? Right. You mean so you're trying to generate team velocity based on past data that wasn't? Um, you can give that a try. Um, I don't know how good it would be compared to just starting team velocity from up front. But if you want something to compare it to because you've never done it before, it's worth a shot. And as long as you understand the cone of uncertainty, it would probably come in handy to do. Oh. Is what? Absolutely. So the impediments are sort of, in theory, you build in the buffer when you do your estimation. However, in reality, it's, it's, it's not the case. And here is kind of what happens. If you look at your velocity chart, you can probably guess that there was some kind of impediment, whether, you know, you know some kind of impediment that prevented people from, from getting the, you know, what they committed to done. Now, here's an interesting point. At some point, this looks like it's going across. Let's just say these are two-week sprints, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, whatever. So you tell me no one got sick or went on vacation? So how do you account for that? Someone goes on vacation for one week. Guess what? Assign that person a fictitious um, amount of story points equal to the amount of work that they would do in one week to keep the velocity the same. Or use mathematical, or do what, you know, factoring, right? You know, just simple factoring in math, factor that out. It's easier, just to, it's easier if you're using automated tools such as Excel to just assign them the story points and assign them as completed. Like they're, they're, you know, let's, just say, let's just say your story points equate to one day, to keep this simple. They're gone for five days of vacation. Assign them five story points on vacation. Right? Didn't come from the product backlog, of, of course. Right? But they just had, they did, they did five story points. The easiest story points of all time, sitting on a beach in Goa. Right? So. So are you, are you advocating that the developer works sequentially on, on items, or they work on two at the same time? Well, Scrum does not prescribe an engineering practice. So that's absolutely up to the team. I think it's a little hard for the developer to work on two things at the same time. We can go like this, two different keyboards. <laughs> I, I understand what you're saying. Right. Yeah, perfectly OK. Question. Right. So the answer to that first question, I know you have a second follow-up, is the use case should be written by the, whoever the product owner is. If the product owner is external, they should write it and be part of that process. 
if, if your end customer for some reason is incapable of doing it, your question is, is it possible to have an internal person do it? Yes, you're gonna get far worse results than if the person who's ultimately accepting and rejecting and ultimately paying isn't as engaged as we want them to be, you know, for the success. Of all the user stories in the first sprint, the goal should be, and I think you asked this question too, or one, one of the ladies here asked the question, the goal should be to get all the user stories up front, but let's just say you're building a very large project, um, it's not gonna happen, right? You get as many as you can get in to get started. Right. I, I would say as many as you can get in up front as possible. So if you, if you can only get, you know, let's say three months worth in, like if that's like, you know, a weekend or whatever, you know, that's like, you know, a three-day retreat with the users and everyone, they get going and then they can keep going, right? They can keep adding the user stories to the project itself. It messes up your estimates, right? Because if your product backlog was 400 and now that's, you know it's only half of the user stories, it's hard to give an end goal, but that's okay too. Okay, I think we're out of time. Um, more or less. So I am going to stand in front of the fan for one more second. But I want to thank you all for your attention. Um, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I, I know I enjoyed. Um, sometimes I'm in front of an audience, and there's very few questions. And a lot of times there's a language barrier, so no one laughs at my jokes, or worse. My jokes are translated, and they're either translated poorly or as an insult. Um, just ask me how I know this when I go to um, Arabic countries. I've had to actually learn some Arabic. Um, so I, I appreciate uh, your attention. I appreciate your enthusiasm. I know I didn't get to all the questions. I tried to get through as much of a balance of questions and material as I did. Hopefully, I mean, did I, did I lecture too much and answer too little questions? Like, let me know. I mean, you know, don't have to let me shout it out right now, but do let me know for next year if I do this particular session again, if I should have maybe less content and more Q&A, or, or, or maybe do two sessions, right? Two, two and a half hour sessions. One that's just lecture, one that's just questions. Um, I've tried it both ways. I've tried it straight lecture, I've tried to stay questions. Doesn't work, mix is hard. So if you didn't get me, if, um, I think I put my email down somewhere, but um, let me see it back to the first slide. These slides are on the conference website, I believe May 5th is the day you can download them or something. I will put my email here. Um, just, yeah, you'll hunt me down. I'm, I'm easy to find. But it's stephenfort at hotmail.com, no space. Um, and I will probably not be here much longer, but I will probably hang out until about 3.30 or whatever time I, they come take me away. But you have another uh, session to get to. So thanks again. And um, I'll see you next year.